Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Greeted everyone. Oh, let me just take this mask off. <laughs> but my name is Kathy Jones Johnson. I serve as the 2122 SGA president of this prestigious institution, Hood Theological Seminary. So happy to see each and every one of you. And we have an exciting program planned for you. So for those who are here in person, and for those of you who have joined us virtually, we welcome you. And I know we're going to be in for a real treat. Uh, I was unable to attend Earth Day celebration on last year, but I'm truly looking forward to learning more about Earth Day and how the Earth, uh, the climate, and everything interacts and how it affects us in today's society. So thank you all again. Please enjoy, and we're here to serve. So if there's anything that you need, please let us know. Thank you so much. Okay, ditto, ditto, ditto on what our H, uh, HTS students and SGA officer has shared. We want to encourage each of you to partake of the continental breakfast um, here for uh, your nourishment made possible by Chef Solutions. So I want to say a little bit about uh, this Earth Day conference and a little bit about the IC Fish, uh, the International Center for Great Science and History. Um, we are a young center. We just got started in 2019. And uh, we were funded uh, by an organization that is the, the longest historically um, organization com committed to scientific content and scientific policy in the United States. This particular event, the Earth Day Conference, came about because we were asked to apply for a climate change and theological education grant, and there are only two schools that AAAS, that stands for uh, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and they also have a, a sub-organization called the Dialogue on Science, Ethics, and Religion, and that's what funds the Science for Seminaries project. And so we were invited to apply for the Climate Change and Theological Education grant uh, we were one of two institutions to be awarded, and so we've been, we've been um, having classes, we've, we've, uh, we've altered and, and revised our history of, of religion in the, in the United States course that's coming up to a conclusion in a matter of weeks. I know our graduating seniors are happy about that. Um, we, but, but we started off with a, a summer science camp last summer uh, with the local group, families and communities acting, uh, families and communities together, known as FACT. And so we're happy to have members of FACT, co founders of FACT here, and we'll say more about that a little bit later. Climate change begins because you have, um, it, it, it happens without human activity. You can look throughout the, the, the the history of the earth that's billions of years old. And you can see that the climate has changed. But what we're living in now is something called the Anthropocene era. And that is human activity is causing what we're seeing now uh, in climate change. And the principal uh, um, um, issue here are, are the greenhouse gases that are emitted uh, along with the plastic pollutions that are choking our soil, landfills, and choking our oceans. Um, all of these are causing the temperatures to rise, which are causing the glaciers to melt, and sea levels to rise, and soil to erode, um, which causes persons' homes and livelihoods to be threatened. This is a very personal issue for me. I didn't really take climate change seriously until about January 2018, when I took a group of students from Hood to Jamaica. My father is from Jamaica, and I've grown up uh, throughout the years, I should say the decades, uh, going to a beach near Kingston called Hellshire Beach. 
and Helsha Beach was always a lively beach, lots of sand to play on, lots of businesses to buy good food and, and, and wares for, for, for tourists. And in January 2018, when I went there, that beach had a road into just a rare strip. And the businesses and the houses knew it was just a matter of years before they were going to have to try to find another place to live. These are poor people that don't have money to try to find other places to live. So that was my first clue. The last clue, uh, or the second clue, was last February. My mother lives in San Antonio, Texas. In February 2021, Texas made international news because we had unprecedented polar vortex temperatures. We had snow and many people lost power. And many people lost water. Thank God we didn't lose power, but we did lose water. And thank God I was there because my mother was very elderly and people died. And the Texas grid was not capable to support such a power loss. And now persons like my mother are having to pay more money because we've got billions of dollars that are enriching people that are, have been made um, wealthy uh, because of that, that, that tragedy. And so we're seeing that over and over again as the, as the storms are getting stronger. Louisiana, Mississippi, they're getting hit. And when I drive home, I can see blue tarp after blue tarp on roofs. And that's insurance companies. Um, this is a real issue that affects when people live their pocketbook, their living room, their kitchen. And it's time that Earth Day is not just something that other people do, it's something that we do because we have no other plan. Elon Musk is decades away of having a Mars colony. And so this is the only home that we have. We don't have. A planet B. And so, so the project that we have submitted that has been funded is that we believe that if we can just start on the ground that we live, climate change has a major impact on soil. And changes in land use and soil can either accelerate or slow down climate change. If we know that we've got bare plots of land. Um, that we don't have anything green growing, then that means that we, we, we have a chance to, to plant something green, create some oxygen, and decrease the amount of greenhouse um, emissions, lower, if you will, than the temperature. We only have a few, few years left. Um, little things like the president has, has talked about moving to renewable energy rather than extraction energy. I know we love our, we love our cars, uh, we love our gasoline, um, but we're going to be moving to, uh, to electric vehicles. Um, people are looking at solar panels on their homes to, to decrease the use of coal and, and the use of, um, of, of, uh, of fossil fuels. So healthier soils is what we all can contribute to. And that's why George Washington Carver is so important. He has been a symbol of this center from the very beginning because his example um, in terms of, of rising out of slavery, of being an orphan, of being involuntarily castrated because of the false uh, science of uh, eugenics, um, and, and in spite of that, having a drive for education, moving from Missouri to Kansas, uh, to, to, uh, to, to Iowa, and then to Alabama, and then making his mark on the world in a way that continues to give us information and inspiration. He's one that, that AAAS calls a boundary pioneer where he is not only a scientist, he is a theist. He believes in a God who is active in the world and wants human beings to be co-laborers with God. So this project here aims to explore climate change through an intersectional approach that uses the voices of women in Easter season. And the voices of women that announce the resurrection is what our project wants to wants to feature. And so uh, there is a theological framework um, that borrows from womanism called echo womanism 
um, uh, that Dr. Melanie Harris at Wake Forest um, has put forth recently, recently that, that I believe offers uh, significant help for us. Um, using the voices of, of women who have nurtured everyone and everything, uh, their narratives, their, you know, our grandmother's gardens, our grandfather's farms. Uh, there is not just a science to it, there's a spirituality to it because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness there, therein. So we want to look at eco-womanism, we want to look at environmental science, we, want, we also want to look at how um, um, the, 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 the religious diversity of the United States um, is going to ha uh, have us break down the divisions. Um, Pope Francis uh, in 20, I believe it was 2015, published something called Lodato C, where he says integral ecology means that everyone in the globe and every living thing in the globe would all be interconnected. And so George Washington Carver absolutely knew that. He talked about ways in which he wanted human beings to understand the way that the mineral kingdom, the plant kingdom, the animal kingdom, even the fungi kingdom, all work together in a way that provides an, eco an ecosystem for many people and all living things can and should flourish. So we invite you to take your notes. I've, you've got your program. I've got some, 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 some notes uh, section for you. Uh, we want you to uh, listen very intently. We're doing something we think that is very exciting. We're integrating uh, science with theological education. I don't think that that's ever been done in a historically Black seminary before. So hood is unique in, in having a center that that's, sustains that conversation. What we're going to do this morning is we're going to begin with a scientist in spotlight. Um, we have a young lady here named Dr. Perez Gerald. She was recommended to us through a friend and a consultant of the IC Fish. Uh, Dr. Janora Waterman. This is her protege. This is her student. And um, she brings a diverse academic perspective to the institution where she serves as assistant professor. Um, and she is um, uh, a local. She just was uh, raised by the Winston State of North Carolina. She uh, went to North Carolina AT in, in Greensboro. And she's got a strong background in agriculture and animal sciences. She uh, did her master's work at AT as well, and then she did her doctoral work at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. Um, and now she is teaching several capacities. She teaches earth science. She teaches high school. I mean, she teaches biology courses. She, she teaches physical science courses, and she's very much so in tune with what is necessary to have science that can mitigate our climate change crisis. So Dr. Uh, Gerald, if you will, um, oh yeah, you, you're there, good morning, but we're gonna put her on spotlight. We have her share her presence to us as she will. Listen to this young scholar on the cutting edge of climate change um, mitigation. Good morning. Can everyone hear me okay? Everyone see my screen? We're good. All right. So thank you for having me today. This is a very interesting uh, avenue. I was actually very shocked. Um, however, being a Christian scientist, I was extremely overwhelmed by the invitation. And so I am very thankful for this opportunity to share my science. Um, with you all today. I think it's a very great opportunity to reach out because usually we only present um, to our own scientists and our own colleagues and things like that, but it's great to present to everyone, especially on one of the days of the year that we are trying to celebrate the earth and think about the ways that we can, of course, maintain the earth a little bit better. So I'll just go ahead and start jumping into uh, my presentation. 
So uh, the title for it is very simple, um, but we're, there's a lot to talk about this morning. I, and unfortunately, I won't have enough time to talk about everything, but uh, it's focused on Mercury in the Lumber River Basin here in North Carolina. So this first uh, image here are some children and they're fishing. And so of course, this is earth science. Uh, this is you know, Earth Day. We wanna connect back to the environment and to the community. And so I actually know these two kids. These are my children. They um, of course are you know, kind of pushed into this kind of stuff because of course I am. When I was a child, I went fishing with my grandparents and it was a great pastime. It was important for us to you know, have that family time. It's very relaxing. A lot of times it's very quiet um, where you're fishing because of course you don't want to scare your fish away. Um, and when I was a child, you know, whatever we caught, we took it back home and my grandma cooked it. And so we ate well um, after our, fish, our fishing excursions. Um, and so now I try to engage my own children in these types of activities where they can connect back to the environment and they're able to see things that, you know, normally, especially for um, us as African-Americans and BIPOC, we, we've kind of lost some of that. And so I try to push all my students as well as my children back into the environment. So of course, after you fish, um, usually you get to reap your rewards. And so, like I mentioned earlier, um, fish is an awesome, awesome, uh, you know, way to, you know, gain a lot of nutrition. And so when you go out and you fish, you can come back and of course you can indulge. So fried catfish, um, it's almost summertime. My husband's already talking about doing a fish fry and things like that. And so, you know, it's big in our community um, to, you know, have those, uh, those opportunities to gather together to fellowship, break bread, and of course, fry fish or consume fish. Um, there's also pictures of salmon here, and we also have some bass. And so fish is a really, really great resource for nutrition. It is high in protein. It's also low in fat. It's low in carbs. There are a lot of vitamins and um, minerals in them, like B12 and vitamin D, selenium, iodine, phosphorus, all types of vitamins and minerals that we need for our bodies in order for our bodies and our cells to regenerate. There are also um, a plethora of omega-3 fatty acids. And the great thing about these omega-3 fatty acids is for special uh, groups of people like pregnant women or nursing mothers, they can actually pass the omega-3 fatty acids to the fetus, the unborn baby, or the infants if they're breastfeeding. And so it's a great way to, of course, um, incorporate some really high protein, low fat, but very nutritious food into your diet so that, of course, your kids can benefit as well. Um, studies have also shown that consumption of certain fish can actually reduce the heart disease, uh, reduce heart attacks by dilating the blood vessels, as well as reduce stroke. Um, and so, of course, just not eating it, it helps our bodies to regenerate and things like that. But it's very good for neurological development, like omega-3 fatty acids, and also great for reducing uh, cardiovascular disease, which is also rampant in the African-American communities. And so, it's always great to, you know, say, hey, you know what, we're going to go out, we'll have salmon dinner, we can fry some fish, whatever it might be. But of course, there's some issues. So the issues or the bad news I have for you guys today, and I'm not sure how many of you know this, but North Carolina is currently under a fish consumption advisory. And so I didn't realize this until uh, early 2020. And I just kind of stumbled upon this information while I was uh, brainstorming for a grant. And I said, wow, I didn't even realize this. Now, mind you, I've taken my kids fishing. You know, we, we usually don't catch much um, in terms of what we can, of course, uh, bring back home and cook like when I was a child. But I thought about that. and I said, wow, I didn't realize we were under a statewide advisory for mercury pollutant. So mercury has accumulated in the environment um, in certain spots and regions. And therefore, it's uh, technically in the fish now. And so, of course, if we're consuming the fish, then we, of course, are being exposed to mercury. And I'll talk a little bit about that um, in, a, in a few slides. Um, but this is just a screenshot from the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services with this fish consumption advisory. So this is no knowledge stuff that you can actually go Google and it will pop right up. Um, there are uh, places on the site where you can actually go and search for um, certain watersheds or bodies of water. And they will tell you what types of fish are high in um, mercury or other types of pollutants as well, PCBs, um, DDT, different types of uh, pollutants as well. 
But Mercury, I thought was really interesting because I said, wow, hmm. That means that, you know, if you're a woman of childbearing age, a pregnant woman, a nursing woman, uh, children under 15, you shouldn't eat, you know, fish high in mercury. But who is out there, you know, when they're fishing saying, oh, wow, this is this type of fish and I shouldn't eat it. So a large mouth bass, you shouldn't eat that fish. Now, mind you, that's a pretty nice sized fish. And so, of course, that would probably supply someone uh, for lunch or dinner a great amount of protein, a great amount of nutrients. However, they're saying, hey, these people in these special categories, you should, you should limit or you should not eat, you know, these types of fish because they're high in mercury. I mean, so you can go and you can look up that information um, in more detail if you are concerned, which I think you should be if you fish and you regularly consume the fish that you uh, catch, um, because there are regions that are very, very high in mercury in North Carolina, as well as other pollutants too. So for the most part, we have three main types of mercury. We have metallic, inorganic, and methylmercury. And the image below kind of shows you the cycle that mercury has in the environment. So mercury is a really interesting type of um, uh, element because technically we can't get rid of it. It's a part of the earth. And so it's an indestructible pollutant. We can't use Clorox, you know, and detoxify it like it, if it was a bacteria or if it was, uh, you know, uh, virus or something like that. It's just cycling through the environment. And so a lot of times there are natural sources of mercury, um, including volcanic practices and as well as, you know, it lives in the soil naturally just resides there. And so of course, different types of anthropogenic or man-made hazards, we of course release it back into the environment. Over time, um, after atmospheric dis, uh, deposition, it kind of just flows with the wind. And that's what you kind of see here in the image. This mercury is just flowing through the wind and it ends up in the water. So when it ends up in the water, a lot of times with condensation, with cloud formation, it ends up in the water and smaller organisms can of course ingest or consume um, or take up the mercury. Um, this process occurs and it just kind of goes back and forth. Bacteria in the soil, um, are heated up or they can convert mercury into methyl mercury is heated up and go back into the volcano and so forth and so forth. So this process just occurs naturally in the environment. But of course, a lot of our man-made or anthropogenic um, sources of mercury have really taken off um, in the last maybe 100, 200 years. And we have sped up this cycle uh, tremendously. So health effects of mercury exposure. So like I mentioned earlier, it's naturally occurring. So we can't technically get rid of it. It's just gonna move from one source to another source and so forth. Um, it is a neurotoxin. So it has significant effects on the nervous systems um, in humans. Um, it also can affect the brain and damage the brain. Um, some symptoms that people might notice if they have been exposed to high levels of mercury include, excuse me, personality changes, tremors, uh, change of vision, um, they might not be able to hear as well, as well as have memory challenges. So it affects a lot of the cognitive processes that normally, you know, you would live at your day-to-day -day life and not think about. Um, it also has a huge effect on the kidneys. And of course, your kidneys are very important to your body to help detoxify and help filter out waste, but it's also very sensitive to mercury. Methylmercury, which is one of those uh, special types of mercury we mentioned before, can cross the placenta and it can pass through breast milk. So saying, hey, you know what? We want women to consume fish. We want them to, of course, um, engage in some of these uh, nutritious practices can also harm a woman if, of course, these fish have high levels of mercury or methylmercury, because of course they can reach the fetus or of course they can be fed to the infant through breast milk. So those are some concerns that we do have with mercury exposures. So I mentioned a couple before, um, but of course there are natural sources of mercury. So of course, mercury is a naturally occurring element. It's just in the environment. However, our man-made <laughs> issues, um, like Dr. Grant actually mentioned earlier, um, we have actually sped up a lot of these processes. So digging and mining in the earth for mercury, of course, can release mercury back into the environment. Fossil fuel combustion happens to be one of the biggest um, ways that, of course, mercury is released back into the environment. So coal-fired power plants, which we're going to talk about in a second and why that's very important to my study, um, but coal-fired power plants release a large amount of mercury back into the environment, as well as other uh, very important heavy metals like lead and arsenic and cadmium that can also affect human health. 
Um, and so mining, melting, as well as solid waste incineration, those are all anthropogenic sources of mercury as well. And so thinking about Earth Day, thinking about us, you know, trying to be more sustainable, this is exactly why we have to, you know, take this seriously, because these are, you know, normal things that we use to, you know, turn on our lights and, you know, you know, fuel our cars and turn on the computer and to charge our phones. And all these are different ways that we use, you know, these natural resources, but we are tearing up the earth, we're de degrading the earth when we're trying to retrieve um, some of these different types of resources. And we're releasing a lot of these heavy metals that can of course affect human health as well as the environment back into the environment. And so we really have to uh, be concerned with some of the methods that we have been using and move toward more sustainable ways because we know we're releasing a lot of these heavy metals back into the environment, especially mercury. So I just wanted to stop because I said, wow, Maybe I went too fast, but maybe I need to go back and talk about bioaccumulation. So the reason the fish is very important is because over time, mercury actually deposits in the fat of uh, organisms, and that includes fish as well as humans. And so over time in an individual species like that fish or a person or uh, a bird, what may have you, over time when they consume other smaller fish, they're just uh, basically stacking on all this mercury or other types of heavy metals or pursuing, uh, persistent organic pollutants. And so over time, they have a higher level of that type of pollutant. So that could be mercury, PCBs, DDT, whatever it might be. So over time, you know, hey, we have a large amount of mercury in this one little fish. Now, the problem, of course, arises when you have biomagnification. So just the individual fish, it might not be a problem until, of course, somebody else consumes that fish. So biomagnification actually takes into the, uh, to account the whole ecosystem or basically the whole food chain or food web. And so plants can take up heavy metals as well as other uh, pollutants. And then, of course, they're consumed by another type of organism and another organism and just the, the grasshoppers like this bird. And then this could be a falcon and they consume these smaller birds, and now they have higher levels of this pollutant. And so this is what happens with mercury in the environment as well. So we have bioaccumulation that occurs in the individual species, as well as biomagnification that occurs through the food web or food chain um, with these tertiary consumers, the higher level consumers, which also could be us as humans, having high levels of the pollutants or mercury. So I stumbled upon this data and I said, wow, this is some really good data. And this actually is on um, the state website. So you can just go and Google this and it'll pop right up. And so what happens is, is that periodically they test the fish at different sites for different types of contaminants. So um, actually in this column here, if you see, this is just a screenshot from the data. I didn't want to bore you with all the, this data that they have, but in this column, O, that's actually mercury. And so they actually looked at the levels of mercury and different types of spe uh, fish species um, in 2017. And they have um, where they tested and the latitude and longitude and the date they tested. So they have all this data from 2017, from 1990 on up. And so I fished through, <laughs> no pun intended, I fished through all this data. And what I noticed was, I said, wow, you know what's happening? I said, there are a couple sites that have high levels of methylmercury in the fish. And I thought that was very interesting. And so it brought me to actually delve a little bit more into this uh, research. So the two sites that I noted were actually in the Lumber River Basin. So I took that data that's free access um, from the state. And I said, hmm, I said, the Lumber River Basin has these two sites and they are very high in methylmercury. These fish are very high in methylmercury. The cool thing about the Lumber River is that I know a little bit about the Lumber River. Um, as Dr. Grant mentioned, I am from Winston-Salem, so I'm not necessarily a country, country girl. Um, however, my dad was actually born in Robeson County, and Robeson County is one of those counties that actually um, are connected to the Lumber River. And so I've been down there for family reunions and all that kind of stuff, and so I said, wow, the Lumber River, Lumber 10, we go down for these family reunions. This, this is where my my you know, family is from. And I said, wow, I really should pay attention to this. Something, I was just like moving through the puzzle pieces and everything is just lining up really, really well. So um, the Lumber River Basin is a very unique uh, basin. It is on the coast, as you can see in the uh, image here, right here. So of course the Lumber River Basin 
is on the coast. So a lot of the water um, or even the contaminants or pollutants in the water over time, of course, might accumulate from all these other types of river basins upstream. And of course, the Lumber River Basin is draining out into the ocean. So a bigger concern even for the ocean when all these contaminants or pollutants are um, going to be released back out into the ocean. So there are basically four distinct river systems in the Lumber River Basin, and two of them are what I kind of focused on for my study. I looked at the Lumber River Basin, uh, the Lumber River, as well as the Waccamaw or Lake Waccamaw. So the Lumber River is actually very prestigious. It is one of the four, the state's four natural and scenic rivers. It also has federal national wild and scenic river designation. So 81 miles of it is actually federally designated as national wild and scenic river. And that's a big deal because that means that the state and the federal government said, you know what, this is a special place. It has a lot of different types of resources for recreation. So people can boat and swim and fish. Um, they can, you know, just take their kids out there to the park and enjoy it. They have trails at the Lumber River State Park. There are a lot of, there's lots of wildlife. There's high biodiversity, uh, biodiversity and um, a wide plethora of different types of plant species. And as well for Lake Waccamaw. Lake Waccamaw has several endemic species. Endemic species are species that are only, only found in that specific geographical location. And so that means once they're gone, or once they're extinct from that location, we can never get them back, so to speak. They're gone, they're extinct forever. Um, and also high biodiversity. And so I thought it was really interesting because these are two places where we have a huge ecosystem, lots of ecosystem services, lots of economical uh, services that these rivers or the Lumber River Basin can pro provide to us, but we have these fish that present with these high levels of methylmercury. So, I chose to sample um, those two sites that I found from that website uh, from the state of North Carolina. And I said, hey, these are gonna be my two sites. And so here in this map, you can see here, there is a site in Robeson County. So that's actually the county where my dad was born and raised. Um, they had a family farm. My grandparents had a family farm. So I was, I was really connected to, to this site. Um, and then I chose the Columbus County site, which is at Lake Waccamaw. And these are the two sites that I found had a high level of fish with the with the methylmercury. So this is just another map because I wanted to point out something very interesting that I noted um, when I started looking at these locations. So the place where I sample is down here at this big red star and not even a mile away. I just hop on this road when I go sample, I hop on this road and I go back up here and I actually can see that this is a coal fired power plant. So we just talked about um, we just talked about these sources of mercury releasing back into the environment. And so the Weatherspoon power plant is only about a mile away from this site, only one mile. And I said, wow, that's interesting. Now, the, the good thing about this Weatherspoon, Weatherspoon power plant is that it actually shut down in 2011. So I said, well, maybe it's not a big deal anymore. But of course, I dug a little further and I found out that there's actually a coal ash impoundment. And coal ash is basically the leftover waste from burning the coal. It's just literally ashes, but it contains a lot of heavy metals. It contains arsenic and lead and cadmium and mercury. So I said, wow. I said, hmm, this could be problematic, especially if it's not covered and it's just sitting in the open because when you have rain events, storm events, especially on the coast with hurricanes, this is problematic that of course, this coal ash can now be released back into the environment and of course, into the local ecosystems. So I definitely was intrigued to learn more about this site. And then I also have the Lake Waccamaw site, which is a little bit more cleaner um, for the most part. Uh, I didn't find any coal fire uh, power plants near Lake Waccamaw. So I said, wow, this is a great site to use kind of maybe as a control to just kind of say, wait, is it the coal fire power plant or is it just, of course, um, the conditions? Is it just the conditions of, you know, all this atmospheric deposition of mercury over the state? So I was reading a paper. So of course, as a professor, we read all the time. And so of course, with my nerdy self, I read this paper and it said the lowest life expectancy was observed in Southeastern NC, okay? In high and low income communities. And I said, wait a minute, you've gotta be kidding me, right? So the people that are in high and low income communities in the Southeastern part of the state 
are probably going to die a lot earlier, premature um, or, you know, very early deaths, early onset of deaths. And I said, well, my goodness. I said, I wonder if this has something to do with, you know, all these issues. Now, there are another thousands of issues that we probably would see with Southeastern North Carolina, including hog farms, which is a huge, big uh, deal. And that's actually some of my first research with Dr. Janora Waterman. Um, so I won't speak on that today because I could go off on a whole two or three hours. Um, but I thought, wow, that's really interesting that the people that live here, like in Robeson and Columbus County, are more than likely going to die earlier than people that probably live in Forsyth and Guilford County, where you know, I've uh, called home for a while. So I pulled up the county demographics and I said, okay, let's look at Columbus and let's look at Robeson compared to the NC population estimates. And so this is actually data from the census. So I took it straight from the census. I actually got it updated yesterday. So this is straight what it is, straight from the census.gov. And so of course, um, a lot more people in Robeson County compared to Columbus County. Um, interestingly, looking at racial demographics, there are 63% um, Caucasian or white um, individuals in Columbus County compared to 30.6 in Robeson County. But in Columbus County, there are 30.6% Black or African Americans versus 23.6. The other interesting part, of course, is there are only 3.8 American Indian or Alaska Native in Columbus County, but 42.3% in Robeson. So there is a larger amount of minorities actually in Robeson County compared to Columbus County, just based off the 23.6 and 42.3. So then I said, well, you know what? That study said, hey, low and high income communities. So I wanted to go check and look at the median household income. So in 2020, we had 38,000 for Columbus County where Robeson County was a little less than that's 35. Now, if you compare this to NC overall median household income, $56,000, that's a huge difference when you're trying to buy a home, when you're trying to move out of your community, when you're trying to go to college, when you're trying to buy healthy foods, all of that makes a huge difference when you're looking at, you know, how much money do these people actually have and have resources to, you know, have to go forward. The per capita income, 22,000 in Columbus County, 19,000 in Robeson County, and 31 for the overall state average. So there are some huge discrepancies in the Southeast region, especially in Columbus and Robeson County um, here in North Carolina. Also persons in poverty was 21.3% and 26.6% compared to 129 for the state. And so I said, wow, these people are impoverished. They are large uh, minority communities. They are not making enough money. I said, wow. And then of course, in Robeson County, you have this coal fired power plant. We have fish that are high in methylmercury. And I said, wow, this is a health disparities problem, but it's also an environmental justice issue. This is a totally point to an EJ issue. So uh, the next slide here, this is just a slide. Um, this is actually me. Um, I am at the NC72 site in the Lumber River. This was in February of 2021. 20, uh, so last year, over a year ago. But this is a picture of me and my waiters and I'm actually trying to sample. Now, the cool thing about this picture is they, um, there was actually a mass flooding event um, down in Robeson County at the time. And I mentioned hurricanes. And of course, we all know the issues with hurricanes here in NC. Um, the coast is hit hard. Robeson County, Lumberton, they are usually hit hard. Hurricane Matthew in 2018 was uh, devastating to a lot of communities down there. But this was actually a flooding event in February. So there was a big storm and it was my weekend to sample. And I said, okay, I told my husband, I said, I'm supposed to sample this one. I have to get samples. So he said, okay. Um, and so when we got there, the, the park was actually kind of closed up, but of course I move around things easily. And so I said, hey, you know what? If I can just get close, I can put my waders on and get in. And so it was actually flooded. This is actually all parking lot right here. So where you see all this water where I'm standing was actually a parking lot. And so there are a lot of flooding issues, hurricane issues down in this region, which also makes this issue with the mercury releasing back into the environment and so forth, a huge problem for the water. Because of course the water is what we end up drinking, okay? So um, this picture really shows that there, there are some issues and we should really take um, account for some of these issues um, when we're thinking about our water resources and climate change and storms and 
you know, all those different types of effects as well as what we're doing to the environment when we're trying to retrieve uh, non-renewable resources. Um, these are just some pictures of some animals and plants that have been found in Waccamaw as well as Lumber River. So the Lumber River has alligators. Um, I, have, I have personally saw these creatures with my own eyes. Um, they stay in the water, so I get my samples, but I am very cautious. I usually take somebody with me um, because I don't want to be alligator bait um, at any point in time. So it's very, uh, it's very cool to see them, but of course it's very... Um, I'm very anxious, I guess you could say, when I'm around uh, these, these big creatures because I know this is their habitat and this is their territory. So I get my samples and I'm very cautious and I get back in the car. But there are alligators um, at Lumber River as well as Lake Waccamaw, turtles. Uh, we have seen snakes. We have viewed um, lots of different types of species. And so it just puts it into perspective that, you know, humans are being affected, but of course people um, are causing some of this uh, damage to the animals as well, or even the plants. And some unique plants that you can find in the Lumber River or near Lake Waccamaw, the pitcher plant, as well as Venus flytraps. And so Venus flytraps are actually um, indigenous to North Carolina, which a lot of people didn't realize. They're like, oh, wow, we actually have a lot of Venus flytraps. They're indigenous to NC. And so, of course, we don't want to lose any of these animals because, or plants because they all have intrinsic value. They all have a right to exist um, in creation, um, as, as they are. Um, and so just like I mentioned with the alligator, I respect nature. I get my samples and I get back in the car and I stay away. I'm, I'm very observant about my surroundings when I'm out there, but it's really interesting to see, you know, people and see how they, you know, function. There are people fishing in Lake Waccamaw. When I go to sample, there are people that have boats. They take their boats out there, which is another concern when you're thinking about pollutants. Um, because I do sample near where they have the boat ramp. And so I've seen plenty of boats, people going out and of course uh, fishing in their boats and things like that, which is a great way to pass time. It's a great way to connect with nature, but of course it also releases pollutants back into the environment. So what we found so far from our sampling, um, we've sampled um, all last year, all the way to this year. Um, and so we've gotten the data back for our sampling from last year, from January to June. And we looked at sediment as well as water. And so what we usually do is we actually collect the temperature and pH, excuse me, on site for the water, uh, the water samples. And we take sediment. So the reason we take sediment is because um, in a previous slide, I actually told you about that mercury cycle. And bacteria are very important in the mercury cycle because they actually convert uh, inorganic mercury into methylmercury, which is the very damaging one that causes a lot of problems. It's the one that passes through breast milk. Um, it can pass through the placenta. And so of course it's the one that's bioaccumulating in the fish as well as other species. And so we said, hey, you know what? We should look at all these dates. And so we have data for um, January to June and we looked at the sediment because it's like, hey, do you, you know what? There's probably more mercury in the sediment than the water. And sure enough, in January, we didn't detect any mercury. Um, however, in February, we had 28.27 nanograms per gram. Thir March 13th, 52. And I said, wow, that's, that's kind of nice. It almost doubled. April 17th, we had about 61 nanograms per gram. May, we had 73. And June, we had 127.47, which is increasing over time and also over the season. The water sample temperature was about 10 when we started out all the way up to 30. And the pH is usually around five to six, which is actually a really good pH. Um, five is a little acidic, um, but for the most part, for the samples, we wanna see close to six to seven, which is a neutral pH. So I looked at this data and I read some um, you know, research and I said, wow, it's actually increasing with the temperature. Now, the other problem, and I, Dr. Grant actually mentioned this too, so I will allude to this, we have an increase in global temperature, okay? So of course there's an increase in global temperature. Um, honestly, I don't think we really had a really good winter this year either. It was very warm in December, January, we had the snow, I think a couple weekends up here we had snow, but we really don't get the nice cold, you know, hardcore cold like we used to. Um, of course, probably because of climate change, what, you know, you hear the buzzword all the time, especially today on Earth Day. And so with the increasing temperature, you have permafrost that's thawed out quicker 
than of course it would have been. We have melting glaciers, but we also have our soil that's warming up a lot faster. And the thing with mercury is, is that when the temperature um, increases, there's a release of mercury. So even in soil, um, like down at the coast, when the temperature increases, um, it's known that you'd have some type of increase of mercury over time. And so that's exactly what we saw here with our data. So over time, we said, wow, you know what? Over time, January to June, it became warmer. And sure enough, we had more mercury found in our sediment samples. Um, and so this is just a snapshot of, of the data. And I wanted to just uh, give you a little bit about what we found so far and why it's important. Um, some of our next steps include looking at water and sediment on other species. So I work with a, a small, uh, very similar to an earthworm creature called a nematode. Um, nematodes live in the water and the soil normally. Um, and I've done a few studies with nematodes um, and impaired urban watersheds. And so what we want to do is we're actually, the student is, is working on that project now. She's actually using some of the samples that we collect from the Lumber River and she's exposing them to the nematodes. And what we're finding is that this water is actually impairing the nematodes to grow and proliferate like they should, which is also us losing ecosystem services. Another thing that we um, are looking into is analyzing the bacteria from those sediment samples because the bacteria are an important player in converting inorganic mercury into methylmercury and of course affecting um, the food chain as well as the food web and of course affecting human health of course if they're converting more uh, mercury into methylmercury. We have added additional sites to our uh, sampling which just means a long day of driving but it's a great time to listen to music and enjoy your family um, but we have added some additional sites that we were um, we will probably be adding at the end of the summer. So there are two more sites that we're going to look at near NC-72, since we know there's a coal fire power plant there. And this upcoming hurricane season, we look to sample post hurricane. So like I mentioned, that flooding event last February, of course, out of hurricane season for the most part, but there was a flooding event. And so we want to understand how these hurricanes are affecting the water quality, affecting the release of mercury on the environment, and of course, other water contaminants or pollutants as well. So thank you all for uh, listening attentively. Um, that is the end of my presentation and I'm opening it up for questions and discussions. Let's give Dr. Gerald our appreciation. <laughs> Uh -oh. We had some difficulties at first with our audio, so they didn't get a chance to hear you share how you are not just a scientist, but you're also a theist, and you're what AAAS calls a boundary pioneer. You've got one foot in the lab and the other foot in the sanctuary, and so that does inform, that does inform your work. Are there any questions? I've got one, but I want to allow uh, one of you in the audience to share what you may have heard or be uh, uh, interested in hearing a little bit more. We've got a few more minutes before we move into our next um, keynote address. Any questions from the audience here for Dr. Gerald? Or even from the Zoom audience, any questions? We've got some scientists in the, uh, in the audience as well on Zoom. I, I, I see a hand here. That was a great presentation, by the way. Um, I do health equity work in my county, in Alamance County, in the Commonwealth, um, a plant where there were um, missiles some years ago, and there's some environmental issues there now. And this information has made it into our community uh, health improvement plan for our county. Has any of the information that you found been in a community health improvement plan, or do you expect to share that with your with that particular county, so that it can be included in how they assess health equity issues and environmental issues? Wow, thank you for that. I actually, um, I think I know what you're speaking of. I think it was the old military place in Burlington where they um, they buried some missiles. Um, I worked with the Haw River Assembly, and they were telling me about that um, recently. So. Um, I know there's some communities that are concerned about water quality and they don't drink their water because they know there are those buried missiles there. So thank you for bringing that up. 
Absolutely. I am a huge component of informing people. Um, as an educator, I think that's one of the biggest things that I try to do is anytime I have an opportunity to teach somebody or let them um, let them know about something, especially as concerning as, you know, water quality and understanding, you know, your community and your environment and what are the hazards in your environment, I am down for it. And so that's one thing we want to do. The collaborators on this grant, um, this is, I should have put it on there, whoops. Um, this is funded by NSF. Um, but the collaborators on this NSF grant are actually my cousins. And so um, we are trying to reach together and come back and we're going to go down there to some of the hot spots that we know of and get back into the community and say, hey, this is what we're seeing. You know, this is what we're noticing. And then hopefully bring them on for some citizen science. So they're even aware of, you know, ways that they could, you know, you know small um, things. Can you they just sum up how you said you and your husband are working together oh yeah so um actually it's my cousin uh, my cousin I'm, I'm trying to can you hear me uh oh can you hear me that's okay can you repeat just just kind of sum up what you said when you and your husband were working on Yes, I think I saw a comment in the chat, and I think we have uh, time for uh, for you to just sum that up one more time. Okay, so um, it actually was my cousin. So my cousin and I, um, she's a professor here at Central as well, and so we're both working on going back to Robeson County and sharing and disseminating the findings, as well as bringing people on for water quality testing in homes and nearby. So we wanna expand this as much as possible to get back in the community and hopefully you know, put some of this stuff into the health improvement plans um, and just basically making people aware and hopefully you know, hopefully some change will come from it. Okay, thank you, Dr. Gerald, we, we got that. Um, Dr. Carol Taylor Mitchell, can you unmute and if you would share your comment, this is a very special, a person to me, she's the twin of uh, Bishop Sarah Davis, who is uh, deceased. But um, Dr. Carol, tell me, will you just offer your comment for the audience so that so we can hear you? Yes, uh, I was telling Dr. Gerald that I thought the research she's doing is so appropriate and welcomed because it's not samples from remote sites that we read about, but from areas where we live. And I also mentioned that um, not only from the scientific point of view and what her findings reveal, but the disparity, uh, you know, that you found you know, in the areas. And so there is work to do on several levels. Thank you very much. And thank you so much, Dr. Gerald, for that presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, it's huge. Oh, it's, 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 it's heavy to, you know, bear this, but, you know, I feel like it's very needed and it's warranted. So I'm, I'm taking it on <laughs> at first. <laughs> thank you. Is there, is there one more comment? Question. I'm wondering, um, Dr. Gerald, how do you think that Black churches, we're here at a Black seminary, Black pastors, how could church want to have to carry the burden alone, but show up in numbers uh, where these meetings are being held, where these politicians can be held accountable, where these politicians can be held accountable, and make real impact? Oh my. So I think it goes back to even, I think like 1960s, of course I wasn't born, but you know, the black church was prominent in the civil rights movement. And I would love for us to kind of get back to that. And so that what can happen is that we have more voices. We have more seats at the table. We have more voices in the community that are being heard. And so I think it's beautiful. And I really want, I think what needs to happen is more connections between academia as well as researchers, nonprofits with um, Black or African American churches, so that we can, you know, have a pathway, so we can share and disseminate. Because a lot of times, what happens is they have, and I actually read this on um, NCDQ. There are times when they say, "Oh, we're going to have these uh, meetings about such and such," you know, in the community, 
and it literally says no one showed up. I said, oh my gosh, like they had a meeting about, you know, rezoning and this kind of thing and nobody came. And I said, that's the problem. And so if there was a way for us to connect so that, you know, we all are on the same page and there's a lot of times there's government issues as well where they don't want us to come, which is a whole nother environmental justice issue, but they don't want us there. And so, you know, they don't announce it. But when people do know if we had advocates so that when a meeting occurs, we show up, I think it would be phenomenal and we could really pull together a lot of people so that we can push to get our voices heard and get some seats at the table and we can actually move a little bit we can actually make some strides and I think like Martin Luther King did it like civil rights move like that's John Lewis you know crossing the bridge that's what we need I would love for it to get back to that level of commitment and sacrifice from all of us um, and you know just pushing along as much as possible. Um, I'm going to interrupt this for a second because we're getting down to the second. But okay. you got my attention when you said fish because I read somewhere, I haven't seen the evidence, but I know in my own personal life, uh, we eat a lot of fish. Mm, yes, amen. And every pastor on Sunday morning said that the fish that you're eating has mercury in it and we need to have an action and show up at the, the county level or the, or, or the state environmental protection level, because you just mentioned, you know, we're trying to get off the pork, we're trying to get off the beef, we're trying to go vegan or at least pescatarian. And it sounds like even the pescatarians are in even worse trouble than the folks eat pork chops. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so, I, I, this is, you have given uh, the IC Fish a gift, and we're going to be in touch. We're going to have an action item. And we're going to reach out. I've got, uh, I've got uh, my, my pastor here, Dr. Brian Grayson, and his and, and his lovely wife. We're gonna we're gonna have a meeting. We're gonna have a meeting about this and see if we can do something. <laughs> Amen. We've got, we've got, we've got, we've got, we've got, we are writing here. We're uh, 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 and 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 we're connected to um, the persons that can that can move. But it is ten o'clock. Can we can we give Dr. Gerald another hand? Another hand. Important research. All right, fantastic. Does anybody need a quick break? Or can we go straight through? We can do it. Anybody need five minutes? Let's take five minutes and set up the slides for Dr. Luther, and we will uh, we'll start uh, at ten o five.
I want to make sure that I give us time to introduce our keynote speaker. A keynote speaker um, was introduced to me again by Dr. Carol Taylor Mitchell, um, beloved sister, beloved friend, twin of my mentor, the late Bishop Sarah Francis Davis, and an academician and STEM educator in her own right. The Dr. Luther Williams is an internationally recognized biology professor, academic administrator, college president, and, uh, provost, uh, born in Wedgeworth, Alabama. Did his undergraduate at Miles College, uh, did his graduate work at Purdue University, um, He's had a distinguished career, and he is here with us today uh, as a gift because he recognizes the importance of raising the visibility of Dr. George Washington Carver's scholarship and spirituality, especially as we're reaching for ways to mitigate this climate crisis. And he is the national preeminent George Washington Carver scholar, uh, I would say, in the world. He has served as uh, the chair of the Carver Birthplace Association that, that holds on to the legacy of George Washington Carver. He's had a distinguished career, again, as I've just mentioned, that has ranged from assistant professor to provost to president of um, Atlanta University. He has served as Dean of Graduate Studies. He has um, served as the William T. Kemper Director of Education and Interpretation at the Missouri Botanical Garden. He served as the Director of the National Science Foundation in the Education and Human Resources Department. Uh, he served as a, an Associate Professor of Biology at the Massachusetts Institution of Technology. Um, he has served as chairman of the White House Biotechnology Science Coordinating Committee and as vice chairman of the Federal Coordinating Council of the Science, Engineering, and Technology Committee. Additionally, he has received the Presidential Distinguished Executive Rank Award. He received this award from President Clinton in 1993 and was named one of the most, one of the 50 most important Blacks in science research by Spectrum Magazine in 2005. He is a fellow of AAAS, our sponsoring organization, the American Academy of Microbiology, the Academy of Science in St. Louis, from whom he has seen, he received, he received the trustee award in 2004. He has received six, somebody say six, Six. Honorary Doctorate of Science degrees wow. and was named a distinguished alumni of the School of Science at his alumni, Purdue University in 1999. He was elected to the, the History Makers. History Makers uh, features prominent African Americans that have made invaluable contributions to our culture and society. And um, we are in the presence of genius. And one genius talking about another genius is a treat. Right. And so join me in welcoming Dr. Luther Williams, the keynote speaker uh, for our first birthday conference. Thank you very much. I apologize for the need to make the adjustments schedule. Dr. Williams, can you speak a little bit louder? Uh, may I have the first slide? But if you can use your Alabama may I have voice, I think we can get through this. May I have the first slide? the first slide, so can you see? Just one second, Dr. Williams.
Thank you. I'm going to uh, uh, speak to George Washington Carver's pioneering methodologies uh, in the context of climate change. It will address sustainable agriculture, renewable agriculture as a subset, emphasis on practices, developments, biodiversity, water and soil quality. Those are the major scientific domains. I, I seek to present it in the context of Harvard's longstanding advocacy with respect to protecting and preserving the planet. And there are several descriptors that I think are crucial to that process. And an examination requires an integrated perspective, view it in a holistic manner. And most fundamental is that his strongly held conviction that bore on the oneness the, 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 of the composite of living systems, animals, and even non living. Next slide shows more explicitly the practices and applications that are particular to natural systems, environment, and ecological st stewardship. The interaction between the obligatory interaction I might observe between humankind and nature. And there's a particular focus on soil quality. It's for the broad agenda, soil quality, sustainability, and so forth. Why is that so important? Next slide. Think of, of his work, looked at over almost a hundred year period. Today, it has transitioned from what I would ter term a desirable good or an activity that merits investment to in fact a grand challenge. And so as a context for the more explicit comments I will make with respect to Carver's methodology, I want to frame the issue by just scantly reminding each of us what we already know. If you if you think about Carver's methodologies from the contemporarily it's important to assess them from the perspective of rapidly increasing negative consequences of climate change observed in multiple domains and, and very, very viable aspects, some of which have only recently been receiving appropriate attention. We focus next slide on this on soils alone. Why has climate change proved to be so destructive? Think of the soil as the living skin of the earth, which I mean it provides an ecosystem essential to all life, not segmented totality. It serves as a filter and a storage site for water. It functions obligatorily as a growth medium to support the life of plants, heterotrophs, including humans, record water, and nutrients. It is, it affords a habitat for a large and diverse set of organisms ranging, if you will, from RNA and DNA viruses with minimum infectivity to large scale 
planted animals. And it even served as a sword for most of the antibiotics that are, that are employed in the dress of health. It is a challenging domain by the fact that it's not a unitary entity. Soil maintains multiple phases. Part of it obviously is solid, minerals, organics, and soil can exhibit multiple phases, both gas and liquid. Therefore, it has the connection, if you will, to the larger atmosphere. Next slide. Why is climate change looked at from the point of view of soil uh, uh, has occasioned such difficulty? Was land degradation which has occurred on a massive scale, reduces the hydrological properties of water, which I mean infiltration capacity, acidity of water, the, the mixture between the gas and, and air spaces. It's crucial because there has been a significant decline in the biological systems. A simple example, birds, eat insects, which are eaten by plants, which will impact ultimately food chain to humans. The other reason for the enormous pressure and sustained erosion, population growth, population growth that I would argue does not cohere to the requirements of so soil, and its properties and the needs of other living systems, or homo sapiens in particular, matters because it is connected rapidly to droughts and deforestation. Next slide. Keeping in mind what I've just indicated with respect to three points. One, I should try to emphasize Carver's view that an approach to productive sustainability, conservation, biodiversity, et cetera, requires a holistic engagement. In that regard, I applaud the planners that who are seminary for hosting this event because climate change is, must in fact be examined in a context that engages broadly its interdisciplinary perspective. Well, the few things I'm going to speak to now go to the impacts of climate change. You one can almost think of them as massive problem sets that obligates what I just spoke to in terms of uh, a holistic address. Just several samples. Recent times, the Antarctic has lost a third of its sea ice okay. over the last 15, nearly 20 years. That's extremely important because these glaciers and ice, icebergs equal 20% of the Earth's supply of fresh water. And the degradation continues. At the other extreme, the Antarctic has been the subject of major ice melts recently, one of which about a month ago, the major ice chip roughly the size of Los Angeles, California, disintegrated onto the temperature increasing up to minus 12 degrees centigrade. Importantly, in another context, the Antarctic contains 90% of the Earth's total ice volume and more sobering, 70% of its fresh water. Combine these two domains, the Antarctic majority of the Earth's supply of fresh water is found in both of those settings. Even in the 
eastern portion of the Antarctic, which has been for years viewed as minimally receptive to change in temperature, therefore occasion ice, this destruction of ice patterns, even it has shown major collapses over the, the recent years. And, and if you extend to that destruction, what I mean by destruction, the conversion of ice to water and loss of the ice packs, and the bergs, even in, in uh, Greenland, where the measure has been many, many tonnage. Other major effects that are generic and that all of these should be viewed as such. Major rainfall changes, major effect on forming on plants and animals. Classic example or much reference example recently is the long discuss Great Barrier Reefs. In fact, the corals that they contain have been the subject of major bleaching, one of which took place very recently. And the bleaching is owing to the fact that the corals entangle with living systems and attempting to produce pigment development in order to protect itself from, from warming. And of course, the, the pigment is and bleaches uh, the life, plant life. Obviously, there have been record uh, rainfall and warming throughout the, the world, including uh, America. Example I make, I make record with respect to connected ecosystem. Here's a simple example. In recent times, there's been a major shift by almost a month to six weeks during which 73 species of birds nest and lay eggs in advance of the case for many, many years. Consequence of that shift is that it then changes by definition birds, the population of insects, which they feed and therefore affect a variety of plants. That is one example of a, of a large series of interconnected consequences. Next slide. The world is not different to efforts to engage climate change just very uh, quickly. The federal, US federal government is expending a significant amount of money research and enabling activities. The current fiscal year, uh, 36 billion. The annual global budget for climate change is 640 million which is only 15% of the stated goal of 4.3 trillion by 2030, which would, and even that will equal 1.2% of uh, the global uh, GNP, GDP. As major activities in individual states by, by uh, various governors um, and others to promote uh, change programs. There is a problem with all of those efforts. Next slide. If in fact, they're designed to promote an improvement in the state of climate change and improvement in, in the mitigation of the consequences of it, at least in the United States and in Europe, efforts have been talk in the negative asymmetric address of climate change. On the one hand, um, especially in core scientific journal, scientists uh, very excellently and appropriately and objectively uh, speak to the consequences, speak to what is required in order to redress the issue. However, and conversely, energy industry leaders hold a very different view. The issue is as follows. Is one concerned with decreasing the consequences of climate change, at least as measured by the three major chemical variables, by which I mean 
carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxygen, and finding alternative energy sources when solar, nuclear, et cetera? Or is the issue, and therefore one could, could promote a transition from burning fossil fuels or one it has an agenda of continuing to use fossil fuels, but to bring various technologies to the process by which one could decrease the impact of burning the fossil fuel. A very, very important point that I would argue is going to uh, be developed efforts by the US and the international community absent an address of this asymmetry. And perhaps the most appropriate focus to that issue might be driven by those who entered this, who are neither climate change scientists, industry leaders. That there needs to be a fundamental and expansive understanding consequences of these two options, one of which in my judgment uh, is an effort to put the proper consequences. Another is to actually effectively define the problem and then bring resources to bear on it. This is not an idle conversation. Think of the following, some of you, whose age might parallel mine. I remember that about 30 years ago, there was a major uh, oil spill, Exxon Valdez, in Alaska. And the consequences were substantial. But the, the broad community, the world, if you will, ability to deal with shipments at, at sea has not changed very much. Because in 2015, there was an oil tanker spill off the coast of Yemen. It actually contained oil four times that of the Exxon Valdez spill. The bullet to address it in 2015 was hardly more as a, as a scientific technical engagement, hardly more sophisticated than what had taken place early. If one extends the, the view of addressing climate change internationally, next slide, the guiding entity for the Paris Agreement on Paris Accords adopted in 2015 is designed to precisely address, address the release of carbon dioxide, methane, uh, methane and, and nitrous oxide. What exactly is intended by address the release. It's back to the issue I spoke to earlier, this, where there's contradictory and very frankly, some unproductive and even redundant exercises because even the Paris Agreement does not render the following explicit. Noted author James Baldwin once observed, you can't solve a problem if you're unwilling to define it. So what is the problem? The problem is the release of these three chemicals, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide into the environment. Why does that occur? It occurs because of the burning of fossil fuels. Fossil fuel burning is essential to the production of the energy needs of the country. So the fundamental issue really is how to address the, the energy needs of the country, of the world, minus all of the downstream consequences. And the 196 partner nations agreed to the agreement to did not have set goals that are enormously challenging. In fact, uh, in one perspective, at least viewed scientifically, they are unrealistic. But the goal 15 years post uh, is, to, is to maintain the global temperature at less than 2.5 degrees centigrade. Lumen, 
exceedingly important. I said, how? I would, I would posit again, this is a goal that's been stipulated without an understanding of what it is that one desires to obtain. The United Nations in this regard has elaborated 17 global goals and it begins to approach significant it's not very substantial, um, but it begins to approach what I, the point I tried to make at the beginning. It is interested in sustainable development. And so sustainable development derivative of, of it should be appropriate renewable agriculture, which then should lead to appropriate attention to the quality of soil and clean water, et cetera. And since the general state of the economy or economic, of the economy ends in economic consequences, there's a way of directing holistically to end in quality. I posit in a non-scientific context as a non-scientific utterance. Um, any entity, be it Paris Accord or the UN, that purports to have an objective of ending inequality, um, does not uh, is not well grounded. I'll say it that way. Next slide. Other consequences of on, but are exceedingly important. Because of the massive invasion of natural habitats uh, of animals, it has been in recent times, been in the last 20, 30 years, uh, enormous emphasis on zoonosis or, or, or zoonotic transfer, by which I mean the transfer of uh, mostly viral systems from the natural habitat, whatever animal that they, in which they've been maintained for, for many, many years into other more suitable animals, primates, and, and often emerging as the end point in the case of humans. Uh, HIV AIDS, Ebola virus, SARS to uh, Middle Eastern, et cetera. Huge problems obligating major expenditures. Think about the problems that contain in any of these uh, human health challenges. What is the in the negative the value of each, and is it appropriately assigned to the originators of the difficulty? Climate issues in general. Against all everything I've just said, Dr. Carver had an entirely different approach. Dr. Carver, first of all, next slide, it was a remarkable, atypical individual. You all know the story. He was born as a slave um, in Diamond, Missouri. He uh, was kidnapped along with his mother as an infant from Missouri into Arkansas. Um, person shown in the media left was covered arranged to have other people rescue them. Mother was never located. He returned as an infant, was reared by the Carver's. Shown in the lower right is Carver's description of the, as I call it, living quarters in which he and his mother and brother resided. Without the benefit of a formal education or even comprehension by others, Carver as a youth, that's the figure that shows in, in, in a statue of him in a forest, uh, was enormously devoted to nature. In fact, one would almost argue that he preferred it. Well, he eventually left the college and went to school in a college school, so-called Neosha uh, College School in Neosha, Missouri for a short period of time. Um, without the benefit of resources or whatever, he lived with uh, an African-American family, a woman who had enormous influence on him. He did something that was absolutely remarkable. Imagine one of 12 
he is a age perhaps he departed Missouri with an um, African American family in Kansas and literally meandered throughout that state doing a variety of things, but mostly seeking to support himself by his attachment to other families. The building that's shown in the bottom is a glad school he attended. But think of it, an individual who spent 10 plus years basically meandering through the state of Kansas, uh, associated with black families, uh, the subject of a series of horrific experiences, including the observance of uh, close observance of the lynching of an African-American male he finally, next slide, found himself in, in Iowa. The graphic of the left shows him sign, if you will, in an art class at Wilson College. All the other exhibits except one is to make another point. I just described an individual who, who certainly was not the subject of a formal K-12 education, but obviously had in, 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 uh, in effect, really didn't have an organized family. He nonetheless was as shown here, a very skilled artist. In fact, his enrollment at Simpson College was in the art department, but he eventually transferred State University in the late 18, early 1890s. And that's an interesting statement that contained therein because he was the only African American in the School of Agriculture, which he took, received an undergraduate master's degree. And he did not do that quietly. He became affiliated with some very, very powerful individuals including the Dean of Agriculture, who an individual became uh, the Secretary of Agriculture, U.S. Secretary of Agriculture. So if you will, in summary, compared to the, his life, uh, Carver in 1896, his expression was probably game, right? His, incredibly challenging, almost difficult to comprehend the late prior to then. Master's degree in art and agriculture, master's degree in the same institution, Iowa State, the department had offered him a position and will he rejected it, decided to go to respond to both the Washington's requests and take a position at Tuskegee. Tuskegee at in part, had few of the resources for the job she was employed, which would be the lead agriculture department. And Tuskegee, in the court section of Dixie. And my characterization of Alabama in 96 is that it, it was a place, at least agriculturally, that had been ravaged by the Civil War and its land had been further degraded by the myopic engagement of cotton production. Although insect ribbon and the African American population who were farmers were at best sharecroppers 30 years removed from former slavery. And many of them 30 years almost slavery were in fact still slaves, or neo slaves. Carver decided, next slide. In addition to teaching, I'm in the Department of Agriculture, visual in the center. Two below, Carver started a major research program Crimson minimalist, which meant the greatest resource was not the technical instrumentation in the laboratory. I think it can be observed without exaggeration that he was a genius, but he was more than that. I think 
forward, the director of agriculture is the individual who has to do everything I made reference to earlier. Oh, in his early life up until his early 20s. And that's the person. He says he is going to, next slide, seek to this man father's down. A rather remarkable point of view. It could actually be applied to the threats of climate change whose unproductive, current unproductive address, I, for lack of a, word, a better description, criticized earlier. What do I mean by that? If he's going, if you're going to engage in effort that seeks to address the problem of the man, as you described, fathers down, then you your problem solving to its end point. In other words, the man fathers down represents the most challenging component of the problem solving exercise, and that's what Carver sought to do. Which meant, by definition, he's going to solve problems that were less demand, and if you think of it as a continuum from minimum problem set to maximum problem set. Well, one of the things he discovered would be an enormous utility uh, was a device that he could actually take samples of how to deal with soil rotation, sustainability, conservation, et cetera, and delivered it on site rather than in a classroom with farmers gathered around a portable laboratory, if you will, called the Jets of Wagon in the first vision. And he continued to persevere with his um, applied agricultural chemistry in his laboratory. The last vision is to make it more simple. Imagine Carver is visiting this African American family, it is and is attempting to have a conversation with them about the criticality of the soil and how violations of fundamental issues that don't permit renewal should be observed. If you examine the photograph and you can see it well, it's obvious these individuals do not per, per, uh, possess the requisite knowledge because they are literally farming up to the base of their residence. Next slide. So fast forward. Now in 1920, 1930, Nikava is famous. Visual showing him receiving an honorary degree, his enormous devotion to and interest in young children, his meeting on the right with um, Harrison Ford, uh, the use of some of his products and trying to deal with the massages of, of uh, muscular problems. And of course, continuing his agriculture. Next slide. That resulted in his three products. Wearing his famous flower, reading President Roosevelt. On in the lower level is a building of a research foundation on the university's campus that he donated, that he made possible by the donation of his life savings. He had coverage in one of the music religious in the early morning in the woods with nature. Next, in terms of next slide, current and sustainability of this work is to simply indicate that our is represented by a life-size statue at the Missouri Botanical Garden in St. Louis. It's the only such life-size statue in the garden and clearly the only one that on is an African-American. Next slide. Just a few snippets. He received honorary doctorate degrees from Temple College, this college that he attended for. He is an art student from Iowa, Iowa State University and from the University of Rochester. At Iowa State, there's a large uh, academic building, Harvard Hall, College Science Building, it's under undergraduate school. We want to spin award from the NAACP, the fellow in the Royal Society of London, which is the uh, monument, national monument, created actually 
in the late 40s, built stands as the only national monument to an African American. Next. You say he had a stellar career. Let's get you one statement. I'd like you to put all the focus on the time frame. Think of the state of America when his work was initiated in 1896. State of America as it relates to African Americans. And ended in 1942. He produced 30 odd products, he started to development. Uh, informed himself and acted out dispositions that says uh, he was going to serve the least. Frankly, and unapologetically throughout his work, he emphasized that will, the challenges that I referred to, truth and early adulthood was God's way of preparing him for the daunting work in the world and be very sure. It, there, it's almost autonomous to think of Carla having produced 30 odd products, done this incredible work with, in the field, assisting farmers, uh, particularly the, the renewal of land as it would then enable. The emphasis on productivity, conservation, sustainability, et cetera. He accomplished all of that at the without being employed to do anything other than direct the Department of Agriculture. It was the farms which the Institute depended on food. He relied all of that and took up a more substantial agenda. It's a uh, quick recollection of that agenda. I would like to relate to the climate change problem. Ellen, next slide. What help his people, and by definition, he, he assisted people, whether they were African American, or white, or whatever. He did so by imp by improvements of individuals who young students who were just recently. Freed from slavery, or their parents were. He showed the impoverished shareholders who had blacks who had very little money, if any, and very few physical resources, how to improve their lives, nonetheless. Science and technology, very, very, very interesting perspective, it was the anchors by which to improve. And science could afford ways to remedy the situation, get it done without eliminating small farmer. And that, that has currency today. Any of the efforts to improve the state of quality of life, next slide, do not give attention to the sustained productive lives of the participants actually often exposed a better example than a series of native populations in Brazil and Africa and the places uh, whose lifestyles have been in the talk, if in fact not destroyed, in order for one to extract resources, non renewable factor. The legacy of all this work stands. Not only in the nation, but particularly where he actually uh, conducted all of his efforts at Tuskegee. I will not uh, them, but they're all relevant to address the climate change. Next slide. Next slide. Hey, I. Next slide. Well, not sure what the situation is, except that 
handle the challenge now is how to renew and augment the quality of soil. Sustainable agriculture has to be the overall objective. That cannot be done by, by a building interconnections throughout ecosystems and it cannot be accomplished without attention to sustainability. Um, uh, and, and creative applications, which occasion novel, novel products. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes, I'll, yes I'll we can hear you. Okay. Uh, the last three points I was attempting is the large number of products that are um, produced and employ. The utility, the value of the product produced was by a fact of 20 to 40 fold exceeded what it cost. What could not be generated from a car Contained within carver, the essence of carver. There was a deeply forged and uncommon spirituality, incredible respect for not only the, the natural environment, but the fragility of it uh, and its value to the planet Earth. Better than through all of his work, bearing on, on agriculture, soils in particular, he predicted major deleterious consequences of damage in the natural environment, which has now seen, is seen as an existential threat. So what I attempted to convey is Carver's methodologies are near during his nearly half century career at Tuskegee, have much to recommend them terms of approaches to climate problems and especially soil quality and function. Well, silencing techniques through the intersectionality of race, gender, and class, sexuality, and religion. She views her work, her research, her teaching as a means of raising our consciousness, conscientization, and a reason for us to get involved in social justice activism. She looks at ancient and modern slavery, and she also uh, engages in language studies. She has written several books, and she has been a contributor to many books. Her uh, first book was Toward the Century, the New Testament, a reintroduction. And her second book um, was um, I may have that wrong. I found God in me was the first book. 
first book. A woman is biblical hermeneutics. Uh -huh. That's wrong too. She wants a book, y'all. The most recent book. The most recent book, How Off the Press, is Woman is Sass and Talk Back. All right. All right. Intertextuality. She won't tell us what that means. All right. Intertextuality, social injustice, and biblical interpretation. She is an ordained itinerant elder in the AME Church. She served as an elder in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, a youth pastor for a Presbyterian Church, and an executive minister, a minister at the AME Church. She has been in congregational service. She loves contributing her to her community. She loves to travel. She engages in self-care as a woman is, that is definitely a woman's stroke to, to love oneself, loves adventure, Reading, writing, teaching, and preaching. In 2017, she traveled to Havana, Cuba, the teaching group of instructors at the Seminario Evangelico Metodista, a Methodist seminary in Havana. And she has served as a visiting professor at the Hope International University in Fullerton, California. She has fostered, been a foster parent, and hopes to one day give a child a permanent home. Dr. Smith's work is important for us because we needed a womanist respondent because of our project. We are featuring, we're centering, we're emphasizing the, the, the narrative, the stories, the wisdom of Black women, of women of color. And so decentering that dominant male voice, that dominant male European voice, it's important for us to have all of the information to be able to do the work that is before us. So her work would be centering and be colonizing the New Testament. You know, we love our word. But if we don't read it right, we're not going to live it right. Amen? Oh, yeah. All right. So we, um, we're happy to have uh, the first Black woman to receive uh, PhD, somebody say PhD. 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 And New Testament and Harvard University. Oh. Respond. Oh. Yeah, 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 we got to get that a hand. Amen. We are in the presence of genius today, and we're not going to let them, the devil is alive. We're going to get this work done today. Because the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. Amen. So, Dr. Smith, come to us in, in your own way. And, uh, Flowers are by male artists. Hmm. 
My response to uh, Dr. Carver today is entitled Our Mother's Garden, yes, yes. Biodiversity and Ecological Wisdom. Our Mother's Gardens, Biological Diversity, Biodiversity and Ecological Wisdom. As Dr. Williams noted, George Washington Carver was born during the Civil War in 1864, and a year before the abolition of slavery. Susan and Moses Carver purchased George's mother, Mary, when she was 13 years old, in order so that she might labor on the Carver farm located in Diamond Grove, Missouri. Now, I didn't know that Missouri uh, slavery in Missouri because it is not South, it's different from slavery to some extent in the South. So according to African American archaeologist, Dr. Jimmy Johnson III, Missouri Africans planted wheat, barley, rye, oats, corn, and fruit. The enslaved and the masters on Missouri farms, because they were small, right, where Carver was born and lived until he was 11 years old, had the same kind of diet, but not necessarily the same quantity. Missouri did not have large plantations as in the South. Georgia's mother labored, labored on a small farm consisting, uh, like the average farm in Missouri, consisting typically of an enslaved mother and her enslaved children, and sometimes an enslaved man. And of course, in, in the South, they typically did not keep families together. Missouri enslavers generally kept mother and children together. Masters often worked in the field alongside the enslaved and had no overseer. When enslaved mothers farmed, they carried their infants with them to the field. I imagine that Mary, George's mother, worked the fields while she was pregnant with George, and after he was born, she carried him to the fields as she labored. According to scientific research, as a fetus grows inside the mother's belly, it can hear sounds from the outside world and can understand them well enough to retain memories of them after birth. It's quite possible that his mother's womb, that in his mother's womb, as an infant, George heard sounds of his mother working in the fields, the words she spoke, the songs she sang, and the prayers she prayed in the fields. It's quite possible that Mary, like other enslaved women, planted and cultivated a small chaotic garden of her own while George was in her womb and when he was an infant. He was there in his mother's garden. We learn when we don't realize we are learning. We retain things and have no idea of their origin. Alice Walker writes, quote, I noticed that it was only when my mother is working in her flowers that she is radiant, almost to the point of being invisible, except as creator, hand and eye. She is involved in work her soul must have, ordering the universe in the image of her personal conception of beauty, unquote. Her, like a flower, was plucked from his mother's garden. But the man he became, his story is also his mother's story. Walker further writes, quote, our mothers and grandmothers have more often than not anonymously handed on the creative spark 
the seed of the flower they themselves never hoped to see, or like a sealed letter they could not kindly read, unquote. Sometimes the enslaved planted chaotic gardens of flowers and vegetables, Whatever, in whatever multifunctional space they could eat out around their cabins, and in any and in any time they could steal for themselves. George Washington Carver was separated from his mother when Southern slave raiders arrived in Diamond Grove, Missouri, and kidnapped Mary and her two sons from the Carver farm. Moses Carver successfully recovered, that is the slave master of Missouri, Moses, Car uh, Moses Carver successfully recovered George and his brother James, but had no luck finding their mother Mary. Moses and Susan Carver, again the slave masters of Missouri, taught George and James to read and write. James worked in the fields, but a sickly and a weak George, uh, George could not do field work. Thus, Susan taught, Susan Carver taught George how to cook, how to mend, how to embroider, how to do laundry, how to garden, and concoct herbal medicines. God prepares us for the work our souls must do through our mothers, our grandmothers, and sometimes through other mothers. In our mother's gardens and in other mother's gardens, we are taught and sometimes protected, loved, guided, and introduced to God. In our mother's gardens is the beginning of wisdom. The seeds of our spirituality are planted in our mother's gardens. Melanie Harris states that an eco-womanist approach, quote, can be described as reflective and contemplative study of eco-wisdom that is theorized, constructed, and practiced by women of African descent, unquote. At the age of 11, George left the Carver Farm to attend a black school in nearby Neosho, Missouri. In Neosho, a poor African-American couple, Mariah and Andrew Watkins, befriended and sheltered George in their home in exchange for household chores. The Watkins had no children of their own. She was a midwife and washed clothes for a living. Mr. Watkins did our jobs. While in their home, George received formal schooling for the, for the first time in his life. He called that his slave master, uh, Susan uh, Carver, taught him informally how to read. But for the first time in the home of this free African-American couple, he went to school for the first time in his life. In 1876, at 11 years old, in 1876, George Carver left the Watkins home in pursuit of more knowledge. Would a flower change its color if its seed were changed, he wondered. George didn't leave the Watkins home in, in, empty handed. Aunt Mariah, as he called her, gave George a beautiful Bible and commissioned him to use whatever knowledge he gained for the benefit of his people. In her essay, quote, uh, God's, in, her, in, in the section of her book, uh, entitled God's Language, Tony, Tony Morrison wrote that, quote, we move from data to, inf to information, to knowledge, and to wisdom. And separating one from the other, being able to distinguish among and between them, that is, knowing the, limita the limitations and the danger of exercising one without the others, while respecting each category of intelligence 
is generally what serious education is about, unquote. That's in her book, The Sources Step, which are a collection of essays I highly recommend. The 100 plus year old Bible that Aunt Mariah gifted Carver was one of the most expensive money could buy at the time. It contained a dictionary, a concordance, references, and study helps. Unfortunately, those helps were probably written, written only by you know, white men at the time. <laughs> but anyway, uh, by sending Carver off with their blessings and a Bible in search of knowledge, in search of knowledge, Aunt Mariah seeded in George the intersectionality of religion, wisdom, and formal education. Of God, science, and a commitment to human flourishing. We do ourselves and our communities, the world, and God a disservice when we construct theologies that pit God against science, that pit God against formal education. In his earliest letters, Dr. Carver wrote that he, quote, relied on intuition and divine revelation for his scientific insights. Rational thought was for him a way of confirming and illustrating truths that had been attained mystically, unquote. Carver once asserted, quote, I never have to grope for methods. The method is revealed at the moment I am inspired to create something new, unquote. I myself as a biblical scholar rely on intuition. I believe it is, I believe that intuition is given to us by God. And I'm grateful I had a, a dissertation advisor who also said following the intuition. God inspires creativity and innovation, but we have to give God something to work with. All right. Mm -hmm. Carver believed that the more information one has, the greater the, the, greater the inspiration. Let me wow. say that again. The more information one has, the greater the inspiration. Science, Carver argued, is, quote, simply the truth about anything. That's right. Uh -huh. Simply the truth about anything. In 1894, Carver became, of course, the first African American to earn a bachelor's degree in science. To Carver, quote, the world was the garden of God. The world was the garden of God. Our mothers and grandmothers' gardens are many. My mother, Flora Ophelia Carson Smith, learned gardening from her grandmother, Flora Jane Carson, in Cleveland, Tennessee. Flora Jane was born 20 years after emancipation. In the mid-80s, I planted a garden in the backyard of a house my mother rented. I planted flowers on one side and eggplant, peppers, tomatoes, squash, and cucumbers on the other side. So I'm getting right. even up. I grew up in the city, but my mother shared many stories of life uh, among her grandparents, with her grandparents in tea, you know, on a farm in Cleveland, Tennessee, where they planted what they ate. Her stories seeded my desire to plant a garden. When my mother was alive, I asked her to write her story so we would have them after she was gone. She wrote this, my, my grandparents, my mother says, George Washington Carson, uh, interesting. My great grandfather was a George Washington, but a George Washington Carson, born in 1878, and Flora Jane Christian Carson. And I, she said, were devoted Methodist Christians. In the summer of 1931, I was eight years old when they decided to drive 25 miles away to Summit, Tennessee, to attend a baptism. On that day, on that June day, quote, we all climbed into our 1931 Chevrolet. Grandmother and I were dressed in frilly white dresses and grandfather in his white linen suit and one of his Panama hats. 
as we were riding, we could see on both sides of our driveway, talking about our mother's gardens, rows of double white spirea, yellow forsythias, red euphorbias, a shrub with thorns and, red, and beautiful red light roses. On the side of our house was a large crepe myrtle with pink blossoms like crepe paper. At the end of the driveway was a lavender wisteria trimmed like an umbrella. The pungent blossoms hung down and around like grapes on a vine, unquote. When they reached the church, surrounded by the mountains, my mother described how the trees looked like a carpet of green steps leading to the top of the mountains. Circling, unquote, uh, circling, quote, the end of the churchyard were red, white, and pink roses. As I stood watching the baptism, my attention was directed to the scene around the church. The roses looked like ultraviolet living colors. The sun looked as though it was shining on an open spot directly over the pool. Golden rays of sun looked as, looked as though you could catch a beam and swing around the world. The trees were standing at attention. Not a breeze was stirring, not a bird was singing. It seemed like you could almost see God in all God's glory. It was an unforgettable day, touched with God's spirit, unquote. Alice Walker described her mother's garden this way, quote, my mother adorned with flowers whatever shabby house we were forced to live in. And not just your typical straggly country stand and genius either. She planted ambitious gardens in still ducks with over 50 different varieties of plants that bloomed profusely from early March until late November. Before she left home for the fields, she watered her flowers, chopped up the grass, laid out new beds. Whatever she planted grew as if by magic and her fame as a grower of flowers spread over three counties. Because of her creativity with her flowers, even my memories of poverty are seen through a, a screen of blooms. Sunflowers, petunias, roses, dahlias, forsythia, spirea, and so on. Whatever rocky soil she landed on, so, uh, so, so her experience is not the same as the sower in the parable of the sower. <laughs> Whatever rocky soil she landed on, she turned into a garden. A garden so brilliant with colors, so original in its design, so magnificent with life and creativity that to this day, people drive by our house in Georgia, perfect strangers and imperfect strangers, and asked to stand or walk among my mother's art, unquote. My great-grandmother's garden, Alice Walker's mother's garden, showed the biodiversity of our mother's gardens. They curated their gardens by planting a diversity of native trees, shrubs, and flowers. Biodiversity requires that Black people and Black culture survive that at least that the least of these survive and thrive for the benefit of all because our lives are interconnected. We bring, even as Black people, a biodiversity to this world. Our environment, including its aesthetic appeal, impacts how we feel about ourselves, about our neighbors, about our world, and about God. The diversity of human life, living species and non-living things is important because of our interdependence and our ecosystems. An ecosystem, I had to look this way, <laughs> is, a, is a community of living biotic and non-living abiotic objects in a particular area interacting with one another, unquote. The slave master's farm as an ecosystem, a place, is a place, was a place where a community of plants and animals inhabited the same space, interacting with each other and their non-living environments, that is the weather, the earth, the sun, the soil, the climate, and the atmosphere. They considered, it is considered, they considered the enslaved as neither human 
nor animal, and as both. The ecosystem of the enslaver's farms in Missouri, like the plantations in the South, counted the enslaved as property, as working tools, as rakes and shovels and hoes. When discussing biodiversity, the importance of thriving, of the importance of the thriving of diverse forms of life of species, the precarity of Black life, the preservation of Black life, and the diversity of Black lives contribute to the planet is seldom, that we contribute to the planet is seldom centered or discussed. Most free Black people like Mariah and uh, Andrew Watkins understood the importance of Black survival and thriving, and they passed it on to George Washington Carver. Black, black uh, women and men planted gardens, not just for their own survival, but for the survival and thriving of the least among them. Only Lee Logan, an African-American midwife in, in Alabama, described her mother's diversified garden. Quote, we had three big gardens. String beans, butter beans, turnip greens, English peas, sweet potatoes, Irish potatoes, okra, everything. Tomatoes, three or four different kinds of squash. Love, care, and share. That's what we did. We had it, and my daddy and mother, they shared it with the ones that didn't have it, unquote. And eco-womanist wisdom says that my survival is bound up with the survival of the least of these, the most vulnerable. In our grandmother's gardens, we see our own gardens. My mother also planted a small flower garden around our apartment in the projects in Columbus, Ohio. She was a member of the garden club in the projects where we lived. She was awarded at one time in first place beautification certificate for her flower garden. My four-year-old self was the youngest member of the club. <laughs> Walker wrote that, quote, it is to my mother and all our mothers who were not famous that I went in search of the secret of what has fed, what has fed that muzzled and often mutilated but vibrant creative spirit that the Black woman has inherited and that pops out in wild and unlikely places to this day. Our mothers and grandmothers are artists who left their mark in the only material they could afford and in the only medium their status in society allowed them to use, unquote. You must, if you have a chance, Google the uh, exhibition of called Really Free, the artwork of Miss Nellie Mae Rowe who after her two husbands had died and her, her the, the woman she worked for as domestic at 71 started to paint. And, and when she was discovered, before she was discovered, um, she uh, used uh, whatever medium was at her, dis uh, her, um, her disposal. Her work, Nellie Mae Rowe, is the epitome of a black woman using the only medium at her disposal until a patron discovered her. Alice Walker asked, quote, oh, how was the creativity of the black woman and the black man kept alive year after year, century after century, when the most, when, when most of the years black people have been in America, it was punishable. It was a punishable crime for a black person to write or read. And the freedom to paint, to sculpt, to expand the mind with action did not exist, unquote. Mrs. Etta Budd, Carver's art teacher at Censor College in Iowa, steered him away from art and toward the, bot the botany department. Yet Carver produced over 71 paintings in his lifetime. Harvard's separation from his mother's garden was not the end of his story, for God placed him in other mother's gardens too. In those mother's gardens, Harvard enjoyed the necessary support, support and space to survive and to succeed. 
environmental activists and scientists say we must plant, we must give plants and animals the space they need to succeed. And sometimes we humans must help. We must help humans as well. Human communities coexist with animals. Dr. Carver was taught in our mother's gardens that we humans must help each other especially the least of us, to survive, to thrive, and to coexist. One way to ensure survival and thrive is by caring for the soil with what we have at our disposal, learning to improvise with what we have. When Carver began his work at Tuskegee, enslaved Black people had only been free for about 30 years. They did not conceive, they did not receive the 40 acres in a mural farms. Black people were not meant to survive. They left the farms and plantations with worn out shoes or barefooted and the ragged clothes on their backs. In Carver's day, the newly freed were the least of these. This phrase, the least of these, we know comes from Matthew's gospel. When did you feed me when I was hungry? Clothe me when I was naked. Give me water when the water was poisoned with the lead. Shelter me when the rent was higher than my wages. But Carver did more than what Matthew's gospel calls for in Matthew chapter 25, 24, 25. Matthew's Jesus raises these questions about social justice acts in a text full of ideological oppressive slave parables systematically used in his teachings. Carver invented new systems and practices, created equity where oppressive structures and epistemologies excluded Black folk. Having grown up as an orphan enslaved child, Carver received some acts of kindness even from his masters who taught him to read and write. But he did not content himself with kindness in a world of Black oppression and poverty. As a successful scientist, Carver refused large honorariums and spent little money on clothing. One writer described his clothing as ragged looking. But Carver always wore a flower in his lapel when he made public appearances. Some say as a tribute to the beauty of nature. But perhaps there was more to the flower in the lapel. Flowers, I read, and perhaps as our mothers knew, are a great rotating crop to help revive depleted soil and attract pollinators like butterflies, bees, wasps, and moths to the fields. One of Carver's greatest contributions, Dr. Williams indicated, was the development of innovative crop rotation techniques to improve depleted soil. Perhaps the flower in the lapel was symbolic of that contribution and of the power of flowers to help improve worn out soils, as well as the overall positive impact of flowers on people and our environment. Dr. Diane Glade argues that, quote, scholars of environmental history say little specifically about African-American gardening practices. In the context of rural Southern environmental history, Dr. Glade argues, we, we can understand the experiences of rural Southern African American women, women in the early 20th century. They relied on the oral tradition of their enslaved ancestors, federal government initiatives, and education programs of African American schools like Tuskegee, where Carver served. These women developed a unique set of perspectives on the environment through the gardens they grew as enslaved and then as freed women combining traditional gardening techniques with horticultural practices. African-American gardens were vital places and spaces of survival, spirituality, subsistence, ornamentation, work, and leisure. Their gardens were multifunctional and biodiverse in slavery and freedom. In closing, I challenge each of us 
in her theological seminary to consider tangible and creative ways to continue Carver's legacy as individuals and communities, and by extension, the legacy and impact of our mothers and our grandmothers and other mothers of ours. What are the ecosystems we must better tend to? You know, her theological seminary is an ecosystem. How can we better practice conservation, biodiversity, and environmental justice where we live? What oppressive, what oppressive theologies, toxic scriptures, and interpretations of scripture must we rethink and or reject that prohibit us from coexisting with other human beings and animals? How can we reconstruct theologies that embrace scientific truths for the good of all human flourishing? Amen. Thank you so much, Dr. Smith, for keeping it real, keeping it personal, and making it academic all in the same presentation. Uh, we, we, we truly uh, got some Alice Walker, amen, who is the, who is the, the pro progenitor of womanist thought, and we, uh, and, and we also heard from Mitzi's mother and Mitzi's own personal experience. We um, are trying to get Dr. Smith back on, but we're having a difficult time with the monitor. But it's also time for us, according to our, our, um, our schedule, to take a break as we prepare for worship. So I thank you all. Give yourselves a hand for powering through what I know has been a challenging technical experience. But as I said, we will be all wearing several hats, and some, some look better on our heads than, than, than others. But, uh, but we were informed and inspired, were we not? Did we not get some good information today? Amen. All right, so let's, let's take a break. We still have things to eat. The, the, the facilities are, are to the right. And, um, and, and we have our, our Jubilee Community Choir in the house, amen, directed and led by the dynamic Mrs. K. Norman. And we have Chief Obatule, a Kenane from Winston-Salem with us, drama extraordinaire. So we are in for a treat. Reverend Deli will come at 11.45, let's just say 11.50, just because we're, we're, we're trying to climb a mountain now. So y'all just pray, amen. This is important work. The devil doesn't want us to get this climate change thing right, but we're going to get it right here in North Carolina. Amen. We're going to get it right. So let's let's take a break and come back um, as the drummer. The drummer's gonna usher us in when we're preparing for worship, okay? Yeah, yeah. I was trying to, I was trying to uh, send, send, send him a chat. Yeah. Uh, so those of you who are still in this area, we're going to make a circle, kind of semi-circle, facing this face. Yeah. Facing trying the, to send. Uh, yeah. yeah. And I'm just creating a chairs for our host of witnesses that are always with us and among us. I'm close now. Now you guys come on in. Come on. Social distancing. Okay. okay. All right. But I only got one person. So we got a panel. Can we have maybe one person every two or three chairs over here? Can we do it like that? Will that work? Okay. 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 Okay.
Yeah, I'm trying to it's, remember uh, where it is. It's, it's, under, it's under the panel. Hmm? It's under a uh, like view or dual, dual screen. That's what it's called dual screen. Right. Is it let's see. Let me, display? Let's try display. Okay. That's it. Okay. And then that's one of them. It's being identified. But well, see, it, it somehow got on trash when it disconnected. Still, it's not. Yeah, from DC or New York. Are you from New York? Yes. I you, I can... Now we need to go. Yeah. There. I think, I think it's... And when yes. you get here, you need to put the zoom in there mm -hmm. and this on a tag. Tell mm -hmm. us what you're saying. So she, and she, and she's, and she, she's a weird too. Yeah. So, so what you I'm were saying, saying to you is okay. that you need to get mm -hmm. over here. Mm -hmm. And then put the zoom mm -hmm. in its uh, internet caption. And then once you've got your zoom in, take this tab that says PowerPoint and make it a tab on <laughs> the zoom so that the presenter can present. <laughs> you got oh, it? No, I don't. I'm okay, so well, sorry. It's okay. It's okay. Let's just look for a second. <laughs> Let me look. For okay. A <laughs> okay. So where are we now? So this is the this zoom. This is the zoom, but it's like we're trying to get everything because I, I don't think the problem was everything was running through Zoom, so that wasn't the problem. We're trying to get the displays. The it's displays are right. disconnected. What's it saying? See how it's it's up. It's connected through it HDMI. It says it don't didn't identify another. That's one two. It's not identifying to mm -hmm. it's something with uh oh wait let me let me try this one here let's see no it's definitely a display problem mm -hmm. that's one well it's not picking up okay so it's not um identifying the monitor oh I wonder if it's the uh the input the input on the, um, yeah. cause it's picking mm -hmm. up, let's see. Let's try that. Up here. Oh. Go to the computer. Keep going. Okay. Click up here and then bring it down to computer. Did it just turn on? My oh, boy, okay. for a second. Thank you. <laughs> Let me go here to input. John, I'm wondering if the input changed. No, because see, this is this just a monitor. It's not, no. But it's, it, not, it, 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 it's not on computer. I know. It I, I know what I'm saying is that, is that the computer is not working. This is just a, this, this is just a monitor. Mm -hmm. All the computer. Yeah. So this is not a computer anymore. Mm -hmm. The computer is in fact it doesn't work anymore. So but what I'm saying is, this oh. here is what you're using, right? This right. Thing. This is just a screen. Just That's a screen. I'm trying to get it to get back. Hold on. I'm sorry, so, John. If we could put it back, back where someone changed the. Uh, yeah, I just clicked it. I was trying to see if, if it had moved. No, yes, it did. The input and stuff is not. Mm -hmm. It's not important. So but it's connected to that computer. Yeah. I think okay. I turned it off, John. My apologies. Go to the input and then get it down to whichever one it is long. And then bring it down. HDMI. Since we're through HDMI. John. Yeah, there's two of them all on there. Which HDMI is that plugged into? Which number? I think three. Three, John. 
Okay. So now no, no, we're back. No, 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 I'm saying y'all should this is this this the easy part. Right. That's the easy no, part. I was this, just this I was trying part. to so, see. So, yeah, so, so don't you don't need to change the okay. We just need to change what's on. Right. That's why okay. I, I, I disconnected to see if it, if it will jump back to where it was. Because I mean we haven't changed anything other than other than we didn't change anything like so okay. It's something. Really, really, it's has identified it, didn't it? It's not saying any longer. No, it didn't keep it. See, it's see, those two are identifications. See, I, I, I don't even. I, those are there. It's something. Patricia. Mm -hmm. Go back to Zoom. Yeah, let's get back on Zoom. Put them on mute. Do mute. Do mute.
Amen and good afternoon. I will read in your hearing Proverbs 8, verses 1 through 4, and then verses 22 to 31. And it reads Does not wisdom cry and understanding put forth her voice? She standeth in the top of high places by the way in the place of the paths. She crieth at the gates and at the entry of the city, at the coming, at the doors. Unto you, O men, I call, my voice is to the son of man. The 22nd verse, the Lord possesses me in the beginning of his way, before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning, or ever the earth was. When there was no death, I brought forth. When there was no fountains, abounding with water. Before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth. While as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the deep, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he gave to the sea his decree that the water should not pass his commandment, when he appointed the fountains of the earth, then I was by him as brought up with him and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. Rejoice in the habitat parts of his earth and my delights were with the sons of men. 
the word of God for the people of God. Thanks. We will now have uh, Mrs. Kay Norman introduce the musical selections, uh, the opening hymns by the Jubilee Community Choir. <laughs> And the winds rage overhead as destruction as destruction's weight and conflicts with its mouth on the dead. Lord have mercy. Have mercy. Lord have mercy. Excuse me, keep his yearning to cry. Numb with grief, the hearts are heavy, seeking courage to endure as the harshest cost is levied on the poorest of the poor. Lord, have mercy. Gracious God, your strong compassion stilled the storms and parted seas. Free and lead us till we fashion worlds of justice, hope, and peace. That's the first one. The second one is called as the fire is meant for burning. And we have music that now that we hear, it's suggested it's new skins and old wine skins. And this would be one of those pieces because you are familiar with the with the tune, but probably not the words. So and this one begins as the fire is meant for burning with a bright and warming flame, so the church is meant for mission, giving glory to God's name, not to preach our creeds or customs, but to build a bridge of care. We join hands across the nations, finding neighbors everywhere. Thank you. 
fullness thereof, and this is the fullness. Now that she's here, I will sit down. Thank you so much. When God created the universe, God was intentional in creating humankind, male and female, in the divine image. With this creation came responsibility to till and care for the land, as well as experience various struggles, issues of greed, selfishness, racism, pollution, injustice, climate change, spiritual disconnections, etc., arose and affected the beauty and substance of God's creation. As we celebrate this Earth Day, we look at the role of ordinary people banding together to care for the environment. We note and highlight the work of Dr. George Washington Parker, who was born a slave, but rose from slavery to make significant contributions in the world of science to, pre to preserve the earth. He stressed exploration of elements of God's creation that included peanuts, flowers, soil preservation, and much, much more. Results come when we are persistent and rely on God's leading to direct our persons. Carver once stated, when I was young, I said to God, God, Tell me the mystery of the universe. But God answered, that knowledge is for me alone. So I said, God, tell me the mystery of the peanut. Then God said, well, George, that's more nearly your size. <laughs> and he told me, just as Carver communed with God in search for enlightenment and understanding, there are many others searching for answers. Let us celebrate the heritage of people of color who made significant contribution to the world of scientific research. We celebrate women who have crashed through glass ceilings in government, science, food preparation, gardening, medicine, education, biology, theology, and all other areas. Let us pause and call the names of some courageous souls who give us hope. We call the names of Katherine Johnson, Ida B. Wells, Dorothy Height, Ernest Just, Piercy Gillian, Madam J.C. Walker, Patricia Bath, Emily Towns, Melanie Harris, and others who bravely dared to tread uncharted social, scientific, and theological waters. Each one provides a lasting deposit that maintains their legacy for years to come. Have you given thought to your contributions to society? Think about those who have no voice. What about the wars in Yemen, Ukraine? How are they impacted the environment? All together. Oh God, we learn to us the ability to speak up and now for the proper reasons and causes. Help us to discern your will as we join forces to care for the environment and make a difference in this world. We cannot afford to be selfish and not fight for the preservation of our environment and justice on all of us. Discrimination is not acceptable in any form. And they give us to never forget the struggles Sacrifices and accomplishments made by persons of color, especially women, help us to set up the way and do our part to the glory of God. Amen. Amen. Amen.
now this is the part that I'm looking forward to because I get a chance to talk about some folks that have made some real significant contributions to this local country, to this local community in Salisbury, North Carolina. And I want to begin um, with um, calling the name of my colleague here at Hood Theological Education, um, here at Hood Theological Seminary, where we work on theological education. Uh, Dr. Mary Love, will you just stand and just join me up here for a minute? <laughs> Dr. Love was the first faculty member to reach out to me. As a matter of fact, when I was doing my interview, at the conclusion, she handed me a stamp. She was a stamp collector. And she handed me a stamp with Richard, the Richard Allen stamp had just come out. And she handed me a Richard Allen stamp, and I said, okay, she, she's cool people. <laughs> and uh, when they offered me the position, um, I began to work with her on a project called Big Changes Start Small. She's passionate about children and making sure that children um, have a shot, like George Washington called I got a shot. It was a slim one, but he made the most out of it and becoming all that they can be. And then she told me about this organization in Salisbury called FACT, Families and Communities Together. And um, it's a, a group of several churches, and they uh, pull together their resources, the pastors, the directors of their youth departments come together, and they initially just work on literacy. And we get our children to read, because if you look at the scores, Every, you know, so often the school districts release the scores, and at the bottom of the pack were always African American children, the lowest in reading and in comprehension skills. And so, fact says we have to do something about this, and, uh, and they have done it. And every summer they had a reading um, um, uh, comprehension step camp, but throughout the year they got programs to help. Parents learn how to how to um, uh, parent and um, all kinds of things. And, and Dr. Love is always in the middle of everything that they do. So when she extended the invitation, I accepted. Haven't been as active as I would have liked to be. But Dr. Love, I just want to tell you thank you. This is the International Center for Faith, Science, and History. Is presented this to Dr. Mary Love, a fact member, in recognition of your invaluable service to IC Fish at Hood Theological Seminary, April 22nd, 2022. Without her, I wouldn't even know about facts. I have to start at home. Thank you, Dr. Love. <laughs> Second mother away from Texas. She's my Salisbury mother away from Texas. And so I want uh, Reverend Mary Hart. Would you come? She is the FACT co founder. I want you to just tell a little bit about how. Fact, just a little bit. Don't tell. Don't don't tell it all. But because it began with you, I just want. We got Mr. Baxter here from Triple A S, and I want. I've been writing about fact, and I want him to hear a little bit about it. But this just says uh, the icy fish presents this to Reverend Mary Harden, fact co-founder, in recognition of your invaluable collaboration with IC Fish at Hood Theological Seminary on April twenty second. Thank you so much. For allowing us to partner with you and your transformative work here in Salisbury and Rowan County. Thank you. And we say to God be the glory. Because this was truly.
truly a calling from him. And it started with prayer. And when uh, the Lord spoke to me, he said, start a prayer group around the city. I began to tell the people that they didn't really know what I was talking about. And I don't know if I knew what I was talking about. But it took about four years. And when God had people in place, the ministry started. So we give God the glory for this. And uh, we thank God for Dr. Grant, who is the director of our Reading, Science, and Creative uh, Expression Camp. We thank God for Dr. Barry Love, who is our Christian education leader. And she does a lot with Black history. We also have a blessing of the children. We also um, honor those kids who are doing well in school academically, um, who attend school every day, and who uh, have good, good, good citizenship. We have parenting classes, and we have a basketball, and um, uh, what is it called? We have a basketball camp. So God is blessing us, and we, we are the vessels. But this is a praying group. So again, we thank you. And Miss Shirley Hope had to leave. And uh, Dr. Grant Harrison had another meeting. And also Reverend Grant. So thank you very much. And to God be the glory. Work, I believe, uh, other than caring for the earth and caring for the children who will inherit the earth. Amen? Amen. Right. So we thank God for, for fact. I want to say a bit about the woman who has been leading us and lifting us on eagle's wings as we are pressing through. Uh, Rev. Deli is, she, she calls herself a grandmother, a theologian, a permacultural uh, professor and author. Uh, but she's a child of God, amen? amen, and she has been given the calling to connect people to the earth. He said, we have moved away from the earth to our detriment and to the detriment of creation itself. And so she is an author. She has written several books. I invite you before you leave to take a look and stop by the book table. You will be blessed. But Rev. Daly is also an energy producer. I heard, I forgot what that, what that community was. But she can shift the atmosphere, amen? And we know that we need a lot of people to shift the atmosphere in Washington, amen? In Ukraine, in Yemen, in Somalia, all of these places where there's so much disaster and catastrophe. We need people usher us into the presence of God and allow us to live into our, our fullest human potential. So I could say more, but I believe we really want to hear from her. Let us put our hands together and shift the atmosphere for Rev. Delia as she comes.
control with water sovereignty, if I do all of those right things, if I harvest the greatest yield using minimal effort, and oh, watch out now, nonprofits. If I clock the greatest number of volunteer hours, hmm, if participants don't learn the mysteries of the earth, I have done nothing. All right? I hope someone feels convicted. If I start gardens in all 50 states for free, so that I may boast, while participants do not love and become one with the master gardener of all souls, I produce nothing. Because people and plants mature in the same garden. So I want to offer this uh, not only to Dr. Grant, but to Hood Theological Seminary, because what's happening here is on the prophetic edge of social change. I was raised on the prophetic edge of social change. I'll talk about that more, but so I want to give this to a fellow <laughs> traveler who is anointed and appointed for this work. And I want, you know, I'm gonna give this to you. And I, along with that, I'm giving her the orientation packet for the Soil and Souls program. You will see that the program design has a host faith community in the middle, and it is surrounded by faith communities to the north, to the east, to the south, and to the west. This is a design that reintegrates our neighborhoods so that as we build resilient systems, we do it with our neighbors, okay? We know that our churches are not in relationship with our geographic neighbors anymore like we used to be. That's right. That's right. It's, it's true. I'm sorry. Truth pressed to the ground rises again, okay? It's, it's what's happening. So this is a design for churches to lead, okay? To lead the resilience, okay? I know we are crying, and I know we are hurting, and yet the church is where we're supposed to come to be rejuvenated. And because the church has left Mother Earth, you don't have what you need. We just celebrated Resurrection Day. There is a resurrection ray that goes through the whole earth. Everything that was dead, that looked dead during the wintertime, isn't it blooming now? Yes. Well, if it can bloom outside, can it bloom in your heart? Can't it bloom in your neighborhood? Can't it restore your church? Our young adults have left the church. We need them. We need open minds and strong backs. Those of us who have led for years, we need to step back and be that spiritual force field. Let them, lead. Let them do all that work. Let them do all of that in a bag of chips. You already had your turn. All right? And we need, we do, we need to let go of medieval language. None of us were raised in 11 and 12 and 14th century Europe. Okay, so if we, not, if we don't speak that language, why does our church have to speak that language? Okay, we live, uh, God is, is new every morning. The steadfast love of God is new. Our language is new. You, you know, we are very dynamic with our language. Okay, aren't we? And so if we are dynamic in our communities with our language, why can't the church be dynamic and move forward? So this is a design, this is a program design. It requires, and this is what I've learned over the last, uh, let's see, I was called into this in 2012. How many years is it? Okay, 10 years. I've been doing research up and down the Eastern Seaboard to create a design that will help churches to lead the resilience. I have discovered what is wrong, and we have a solution, all right? I'm not here to talk about what's wrong. I'm here to talk about what we can and should and will do. And that's what this design is about. I'm giving this packet to her, because this is the town. We already know she is anointed and appointed, that God has given her the strength and the resources 
to bring together things that human beings have torn apart. All right? So what is this that I have set in these chairs? And I'm, I haven't forgotten you all up there, okay? I'm going to talk to you in a minute. <laughs> I'm talking about you guys online. In fact, some of this might be for you. Okay, so there are four packets that I have set around the, uh, our circle of worship. And while I'm going through my message, I want you to see, is God calling you to be a food sovereign church? Ma, ma, ma. Is God calling you to join with Reverend Dr. Sharon Grant to lead the resilience that the church should lead? This requires at least four other participants. And, they, and I don't care if to the north means you gotta go to Canada, be in a relationship. If the South means that someone, your Southern neighbor across the street, be in a relationship, covenant with one another, that we will learn together, that we will accept leadership of young adults, that we will have a land-based spirituality the way it was when Jesus walked from earth. He gave agrarian examples all the time. Every night, Jesus went to the garden to pray, okay, because the garden rejuvenated him. Don't you know people got on his nerves? <laughs> you know, after he tore up the temple, he had to go to the garden. <laughs> we all need to be in the garden, and that's what this is about. So I want, to, when we do the invitation, you know, I, so I'm for real, right, okay? I'm not, this, I'm not playing. <laughs> I want someone to say, okay, I don't mind working with, with Dr. Grant. I'll be one of these food sovereign churches. I'll, I'll, we'll try out this Soil and Souls program. Let's see if we can bring our young adults back into our community. That's the challenge. Okay? So, okay. I haven't even started yet. <laughs> but that's important. I had to set the stage. So, wisdom is calling. Yeah. Okay, wisdom is calling. Can't you hear her calling? Wisdom is calling. She's calling out to each one of us. Come home. Come home. What does that mean to be at home? When I was at home, I began reading the Bible at eight years old. Read it straight through for four straight years. And then after that, I wanted to see who was practicing what was in this book. <laughs> so I'm, uh, I'm a sixth generation activist minister. My relationship with, with Christ was strong. Okay. So God allowed me to go a whole bunch of places. I crossed a whole lot of boundaries. Okay. Because I wanted to see who was operating the way Jesus said we're supposed to operate. Where the, who's fulfilling these promises? Okay, who has joined the science with the spirituality so that you can manifest what needs to happen? Okay, who has, has that social alchemy so that you can transmute all of the evil that has been poured into our communities? Who's going to do that? And so I've learned a few things. That's why I've studied in my uh, a con tradition. I have a con, uh, you know, con of, and also my Yoruba tradition. Right now, I am studying the sacred geometry, okay, of how you plant a field so that you don't have to take care of it anymore. My, I'm home right now in North Carolina. What do you mean you're at home in North Carolina? Don't you live in New York? Yes, I live in New York. But my ancestral church is right down the street in Chester County, right across the line. My great-great-grandfather uh, planted churches after the Civil War, and at least one of them is still worshiping. I, was, I preached their 150th year anniversary. And when I walked those grounds, okay, he bought nine, he, at that time, he bought 90 acres of land for a worshiping community. They still have 30 acres left. I walked those grounds, and God told me, just like I'm talking to you, this is my garden. I said, no. I said, this is my garden. The forest, the pine trees. I said, this is my garden. You don't water it. 
You don't fertilize it. It takes care of itself. There are seven layers that work together in harmony. That's what we need to get back to. When God planted the tree in the Garden of Eden, that was the beginning of the garden. We need to restore a gospel of the garden, not a farm, not a plantation. Okay, let's make it plain. In the garden, there is rejuvenation. In the garden begins with the tree because it holds the soil and you get enough trees and they create moisture. The mycelium, that's the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit within the, uh, the natural world. What's mycelium? What's, mycelium is that little white and orange things that you that little threads that you see yeah. in the soil. Yeah. When they get big up, you know, when they get big and grown up, they become mushrooms. That's right. Okay? So the mycelium are the ones that say, what do we need over here? What do we need over there? And they just send them things out. They're sending plants out. They're sending minerals out. They're sending chemicals out. Don't you know that the oyster mushrooms can transmute oil? Transmute. That means change it from being a cat to a dog. Yes. it can. God has put things on the earth that can change everything, and there's some people don't want us to know that. We're not going there. Because I want you to focus on it can be done right now. Shell Motor Company, Shell Oil Company, quiet as it's kept, that's what they use when they mess up the oceans. That's one of the layers of remediation. Mushrooms. We can grow mushrooms. That's right. Okay, I'm just I'm just gonna give you a few because it's a whole lot of things that we need to bring back. So why is it? And we lost that connection with home. Okay, why is it? didn't happen by accident? All right, we have to understand that there are people who don't want us connected to the earth because if we're connected to the earth and if we bring that connection, that understanding into our everyday life, they can't do what they do to us. All right? So that means a spell has been cast on all of us. You better stop. You better talk. <laughs> okay, a spell. And Jesus came to set the captives free. We are free from every spell on heaven and on earth. Jesus is Lord of creation. So why are we being oppressed? Why are we allowing someone else's idea of how we should live, breathe, and have our being? What? That's where Jesus is supposed to be. My parents were on the front line of social change. Between the two of them, each of them won a successful national civil rights suit and a successful statewide civil rights suit. That's four civil rights suits in one family in about 20 some odd years. That's a lot. That's a lot of fighting. Okay, and I've seen the emotional toll that it takes on activists. That's why when I came into ministry, I said, mm -hmm. okay, I'm going to go this way. I'm going to go contemplation. <laughs> <laughs> I want to make this real plain because I remember one night, you know, we're driving and we're driving by a cemetery and my parents are having a quite a not friendly conversation. And all of a sudden, my mother jumps out the car and runs through the graveyard. And I, I'm in the back seat, and I just remember pulling something over my head. I don't know what it was. I know that later on that night, they gave me a, a shot because I went into shock. I only found out two years ago. I'm 65. That happened when I was nine years old. I only found out two years ago that that was the night my mother tried to take her life. That's how the activism impacted her. You know there was fallout in our family. That's why it was important when we were children, my father used to take us camping. I remember also at that age laying my head on the earth and feeling the coolness and listening to the wind rustling through the trees, and it felt like my consciousness was being made. I remember as a teenager, we lived in a different state, but my parents well, bought property 
uh, next to a um, you know state land. So there was lots of forest, open forest land. And this was in the this is when each one of them was fighting in a civil rights suit against you know when my father was fighting TRW, and my mother was fighting the local community college. And every week my mother would say, "We're going to the mountains." And stupid teenagers said, "We go. We didn't want to." She didn't care. She was a parent. She said, go get your friends. We're going. We loved it as soon as we got there. Teenagers, right? I'm just telling you that. You got to be parents there, okay? <laughs> they don't know everything. That's why wisdom is calling, because we, we are here. We get information, but until we bring it into our actions, there's no wisdom. We have to have wisdom to make decisions. Okay, so being in nature was an important part of their restoration. And I say that because even today we find that activists all across the country are in despair. That's right. People who are working, who say that they're working for Mother Earth, they are in despair. I said, how can you be in the middle of beauty and abundance and rejuvenation and be in despair? That's because you're not in relationship. Okay, we have objectified nature. It's, oh, this is pretty. But why are you not receiving that the cells? Why are you not receiving that rejuvenation, that restoration, that resurrection energy? Wow. The sun rises every morning, so should we. I can feel the sun rising. I know I better get up. Because if I don't get up, I'm going to be real lazy, I'm going to be drugged and up. But we are the mirror image of nature, human beings. We're the last part. There's a piece of nature in all of ourselves. And that's part of what we discuss in the soil and soul footprint. You know, not only physically, emotionally, mentally, it's not possible to be balanced unless you are have an intimate relationship with nature. Our cells require that. We are in a symbiotic relationship on a physiological level. And that's why our ancestors were in so, oh. You know, it wasn't that they were worshiping everything that they saw, but there's consciousness in everything. It says in the beginning was the word, that word logos. Okay, we say it just means word. In the Greek, it also means consciousness. In the beginning was consciousness. And consciousness was everywhere. Everything has consciousness. Trees are not the same as us. I understand that. But they have consciousness. That means intelligence. Trees actually move. The scientists are telling us that the trees are sending signals to each other to move north. Because it's getting too hot down south. Yes, that's true. Why are the scientists telling us that and we're not listening? Why can they see what God is doing and those of us who are called by his name are, don't see it? I don't, I don't quite understand that. I want to talk a little bit more about coming home. What does it mean to be at home? Now we know when you're at home and everybody, we used to live in big houses, right? Some of us lived in big houses because we had a whole bunch of people in there. We had several generations there. Maybe Big Mama allowed you know, the next generation to bring their family in there. And that's, that's what I mean about big house. I don't mean 10,000 square feet with two people in it. That's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> well, you act a certain way when you're in Big Mama's house. Yeah. All, right. Yeah. All right? You don't just put your feet up on the coffee table. Oh, no. Okay? You got to take some things off when you come in. Maybe it's your hat. Maybe it's your shoes. It depends on what the house rules are. That's right. Okay? You don't just go in the kitchen and tear it up and leave dirty dishes off. Not in Big Mama's house. Oh, no. You talk. Okay? We are in Big Mama's house. And we are tearing it up. You know that if you come home and you see food thrown up on the walls and you see clothes scattered all over, you say, oh, oh where's Big Mom? She's not home. She's not here. Because if she was here, you couldn't do that. Okay? So what does it mean when our earth 
is being torn up. Where is the divine feminine? Because if we didn't honor and respect our mother, okay, this could, you know, this couldn't happen. What have we done with her? Some of them tied her up and put her in the basement. How did you do that to your mother? And, and you all know that the house is being torn up. Who stays in a house that's on fire? Nope. Insane people do. That means you have lost your ever loving mind. <laughs> so if you want the house cleaned up, if you want the earth cleaned up, you've got to bring Big Mama back in. I mean, there's some rules, there's some regulations, there's some patterns, there's some protocols you need to follow that you've gotten lazy and you made a lot of money and that, no, time out for that. The house is on fire and we're in it. I don't plan to burn up in my own house. Okay, that's why I'm out here with these young people who have left prestigious careers. You know the football player that turned uh, uh, turned away $35 million contract because God told him to start a farm right here in North Carolina. Okay, I'm out in the fields with people, uh, neurophysicists, all kinds of degrees. Spirit told them to come back to the land. The intelligentsia has called back to the land. Okay, so we know that God, someone is listening to God. Church, someone is listening to God. Can we join partners with them? Because they are out there and they want a spiritual root. Okay, they're hungry. They're starved for that family feeling. But they're following God. You call, I mean, if you're not coming, they're not going. <laughs> you got to come with it because they have stepped into the prophetic role. They have, they're on the prophetic line. And you need to come behind them, which is where you're supposed to be anyway at this stage in life. Oh. <laughs> I so much to say. I do again teaching moment. Why did I put this family up here with the aunt? You guys know this is an aunt? Okay. This is the first Christian cross. Why do I say it's the first Christian cross? Remember when um, the Enoch was baptized and went back to Ethiopia? Okay. So he, he, he got the message, and this is what they use to symbolize eternal life. Well, what, is, what is that? I mean, it's not just, I mean, so um, that means it goes way back to ancient Egypt. What is that a, a picture of? That's a picture of the woman's womb. Eternal life. A healthy womb makes a healthy world. Okay, that's the uterus, the cervix, and the birth canal. My God. That's eternal life. So you have people who have been honoring the divine feminine within the Christian tradition for a long time. We just don't happen to be on that leg of it. So don't be telling people that they are worshiping the devil. You know, stop demonizing this ancient knowledge. Okay. Don't you know that the book of Proverbs is a multicultural compilation of sayings? It wasn't just Hebrew people. It was Mesopotamian people. It was Egyptian people. It was people from all around the world because wisdom teachers acknowledge and wisdom. Period. All right? And that's where we, if we are going to be wise, we need to acknowledge wisdom. Period. I don't care where it comes from. The sun shines on the world, doesn't it? It rains on the just and the unjust alike. That's truth. Okay? So you, you know, maybe you don't like, you don't have to be in that garden with them. But you do need to be in a diverse garden with a, a wide variety of people. Because sometimes until you see the opposite of yourself, you don't even know who you are. Let's wrap it up. Okay. <laughs> it's good, though. It's good. It's good. 
So we're in the book of Proverbs, the eighth chapter. I'm just going to end on this. We know that wisdom is hanging out with God. All right? She says, daily I will sit to the light. That's intimate knowledge. That's joyful knowledge. Okay? That's where we're supposed to be. That's where wisdom is supposed to be. She says, I was beside him like a master worker. And I daily I was his delight, rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in his habited world, and delighting in the human race. I maintain this is the first beloved community. This is the beloved community. This is what it looks like to be beloved. God, creation, all of creation and humanity working together. So as we come together to restore what has been lost, to lift up what has been put down, I think we need to come home to Mother Earth. And we need to understand, we need to move, we need to examine what is it that keeps us from loving our mother. This requires contemplation, it requires healing. And that's what these groups will be doing. They're not just going to be learning ecology and how to do stuff. They're going to be learning how do we reconnect our soul to the earth so that we can or not just thrive, we can survive and thrive Amen. as a human race. Because that is what we are designed to do. So right now I'm going to issue the invitation. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. Jesus is calling. Come home to me. Come home to me. Come home to me in creation. So, and as you play, I want you all to think. Did it, was anything said that resonated with you? Can your church community be a part of this? Is Jesus calling you to be a food sovereign church? To love your mother? To be a part of restoring creation? Now is the time. Raise your hand. Put a little emoji up here on the board. Who is going to join with Dr. Grant? She cannot do this by herself. She's from my home church. I live from my home church in Burlington, North Carolina. I was in the forest breaking. It's a beautiful day like today, and all of a sudden, this big booming voice said, This is not your work. I said, What? I was angry. And you know what happened? A swarm of ticks drove me out of the forest. I have never known ticks to swarm, but they did that. I went inside and I, I cleaned up, and I went inside and I knocked and I said, What do you want me to do? Another visible, I mean, audible voice, just like I'm talking to you. I want you to teach the church how to model sustainability. You have to answer that call today. I'm not playing. Okay? I'm not, I'm not telling you all the stories, all the pain I've gone through for the last 10 years to be on the front edge of social change because the house is on fire. church because if you do what we have in this you will your church 
will be a multi-generational living, breathing institution.
be a part of life. And I uh, asked him to get Jesus to come to your mind. But he came to see us. So this is going to be a few minutes. To let all that, that we've been through. We, we did thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Um, thank you for the invitation to Dr. Grant. But first, I want to start out by thanking you, Dr. Grant and Dr. Love, for your vision, for your leadership in this project. As other projects and partnerships as well, we have the JPS and those dialogue and science sessions and innovation and the program I work with. I believe this is um, kind of grant, not the mission. And if it wasn't for the North Star of your project, so we started off with two, but because of y'all's work, we were able to add four more. And because, and because of how y'all started with the fact, our funder, I, and I'd be remiss if I didn't even say her name, Ms. Leslie Sternberg, she wouldn't have donated more money. And because of y'all's work, we came to the far south as Texas and as far north as Manitoba County. So, thank you all. And I do want to thank all the presenters, Dr. Gerald, Dr. Williams, the respondent, and Dr. Smith, Sermon, and all the all, all that you brought, the shifting atmosphere of Reverend Dele as well. And I'll leave us with this. I was telling Dr. Smith about this. I remember my great grandmother's garden and my grandmother's flower bed. Mm -hmm. And one thing my grandmother told me, she said, everything on the earth is good and nourishing. She loved taters and apples. That's country. We, we, and coming home, I grew up about okay. three hours away from here mm -hmm. in a small town called Canton, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. 14 miles west of Asheville, they have Bird Town, oh, yeah. Wayne County. Oh, yeah. so we have our uh, Christian band. Cherokee heritage as well. And it all ties in quite succinctly in that what we learned from Dr. Gerald today is that we're poisoned or we're, we're not helping our environment and our own food sources and those ecosystems. And so we have to be our own solution to the problem that we're, that we're uh, causing. And I think the model that was set up here and the conversations and the presentations done here today is a, is a wonderful start and a North Star for that work. So thank you very much, Dr. Grant. I'm delighted to have you Thank you.